Supremacy Games Chapter 426 to 450 Chapter 426 Being watched by the Earthlings Felix couldn't help but laugh at the sound of that as he truly believes that anyone who dared to step into the desert with him was bound to damnation F asterisking hell give us a chance He already has more abilities than us It's not a totally lost game I have wings of Akuri's bloodline one of the fastest beasts in Tier 3. As long as I create a vast distance between me and the rest, it wouldn't matter much if the third zone was beneficial to him. Valkyrie thought. Hey, I named myself Speedster for a reason. A blue-haired man with a tight-fitted white sports uniform scoffed after seeing Felix's reaction. He understood that Felix was thinking that the game was already in the bag since everyone had watched the battle against Mr. Gamma and saw how he was able to move freely on the sand. They didn't know what ability that was, but it was apparent that it would be a huge movement boost to Felix at the desert zone. That being said, the speedster didn't feel threatened at all by Felix since he knew that he was going to leave everyone to eat his dust the moment the game began. By the time Felix reaches the desert, he would have already reached the finish line. Be wary of the desert as there would be recurring sandstorms hitting from all possible directions. Dallas mentioned calmly, in addition, there would be beasts underneath the sand, like sandworms, scorpions, etc. Do know that all of the beasts in the game will be at tier 3. Oh, one last thing, anyone who flies 10 meters above the desert would face a much worse retaliation from the beasts than those on the ground. The players didn't like the sound of that but they were already used to facing challenges like those in every game. That should be it. Dallas glanced at his bracelet and said, please ask your questions. The players quickly raised their hands and Dallas picked one of them randomly. Can beasts enter the teleportation mirrors? Yes. The players drew a deep breath in dread at the sound of that. Most of them were planning on relying on those teleportation mirrors to escape to the roof in case they were chased by beasts. But it seemed like that was merely wishful thinking. Next. May I know when those disasters are going to occur and how long they were going to last? I don't know, next. Is the tsunami going to smash us against the city gate if we get caught in it? No. Dallas clarified, this is an obstacle marathon not a death trap. All of those disasters are programmed to hinder your progress first and foremost not get you killed. Hence, the tsunami will simply take you back to the shore and disappear. The players sighed in relief at the sound of that. Though no one wanted to get caught in a tsunami since getting taken to the shore simply meant that it was game over. Upon seeing that only two players still had their hands up, Dallas asked them, is your question about the titles? The two players nodded their heads while lowering their hands. Dallas fixed his black bow tie and said, For the unique title, you will need to emerge first in all three zones. The title is called, Always First Dot. Damn, that sounds terrible. Felix commentated speechlessly. He wasn't the only one with the same opinion as not a single player seemed moved by the naming. Those who were familiar with Dallas knew that his unique titles had horrible names that wouldn't make anyone aim for them. Dallas didn't care about their reaction as he carried on, as for the MVP title, you need to win the marathon after giving everyone half an hour head start. Yeah, that ain't happening. Felix who was thinking he would go for the MVP title removed that thought immediately after hearing the requirement. 30 minutes? Felix knew that 10 minutes was already too much. Based on the scouting he had in the past five days, he understood that there were four players capable of beating him in speed. He had no intentions of giving them 30 minutes head start. That should be all. Dallas snapped his finger and said one last time, let's meet on the track and good luck to all participants. When Felix looked at him, he noticed that he had received a casual look before Dallas's body disintegrated. I should be expecting an interview attempt. Felix mused, I should take advantage of it and bullshit a bit. Look at him smiling without care. I just want to slap the shit out of him. A wide-shouldered man with a thick orange beard said with a suppressed tone near two players. 
I don't know about you guys but I am planning on assaulting him with an elemental salvo the moment he enters the city gate. A man with a ponytail hairstyle and a loose grey robe said with a cunning smile. You too. Another player near him said quite loudly, I am also going for it. A selfish f girl like him deserved to be cut into multiple pieces. I thought I was the only one with the idea. I will be doing so as well. One player after the other kept clamoring about assaulting Felix at the city gate out loud, making it impossible for Felix to not hear about it. In the end, Felix was speechless to find out that all the 64 players in the game had joined the hubbub in ambushing him. Sigh, you guys should have spoken a bit softer. Valkyrie's cry shook her head in disapproval and said while pointing her thin finger at Felix, now that you have scared him. I doubt he would dare to step outside of his station at the beginning. True, we didn't consider that. Whatever, I will still camp his station for five minutes. I will do the same. Just like before, the players had ended up with a unanimous decision to wait five minutes before Felix's station. All of them seemed serious to respect that decision but Felix was able to notice subtle hints of ridicule and dread when they took glimpses of him. His eyes might not allow him to see anything but the truth yet but he could still spot those subtle hints with his enhanced vision. Upon connecting some dots, Felix realized what those clowns were attempting to do by playing this charade in front of him. They are trying to scare me into staying in my station so I wouldn't be gathered with them during the start. Felix smirked, they are scared of killing me and also of getting killed by me since they must understand that it is impossible for them to win against me solo. This made Felix conclude that no one would be camping him at all. Honestly, it didn't even matter to him that much if they truly camped him or not since he had created a countermeasure for the situation anyways during the past five days. Hence, he simply kept enjoying the clown show they were putting in front of him by giving them head nods of approval. The players were weirded out by his behavior but they ignored it and started talking about creating alliances between them without bothering to approach Felix. Before long the one hour of friends making had ended and the players started to get teleported outside of the hall one by one. Hopefully, my fans didn't give up on me. Felix wished while closing his eyes shut. In the Earthling team headquarter, in the open space of the drop, a large holographic screen was placed in front of hundreds of chairs that were packed to the limit with the team members and the drop's staff. Some were even sitting on the hover platforms due to the lack of space. Some were talking out loud and some were just staring at the rowdy stadium, not bothered by their colleagues' chatter since the stream's noise was covering over anything. Speedster. You got this baby. Landlord, you ugly asterisk CK. Tell us the method. Landlord, I love you. Val cry, win this for me. Cheers and chants were resounding in the drop, making Olivia and the rest to feel like they were sitting in the stadium. Well, feeling was just a feeling, and honestly watching the stream would never be the same as watching the game live. Alas, it was impossible for Olivia and the rest to secure their tickets since they got sold out the second Felix had appeared in the game's participation list. Billions of people had competed for those tickets but only 40 million managed to secure a seat in the stadium. There were some who took advantage of the opportunity to sell their ticket at 10 times the price making a load of profit by just being lucky. Too bad, not a single soul on earth managed to get lucky with a ticket. If Felix didn't forget that he was exposed, he would have given a couple of tickets to his grandfather and Olivia since players had a little bit of privilege. Too bad, it was already too late and right now Olivia, the Earthling team, his grandfather and even the council could only watch the live stream. Whoosh whoosh. They are teleporting. Olivia said in excitement while glancing here and there, wanting to locate Felix amidst the players. Soon, she spotted him standing all alone in the middle of the players like he had a coronavirus and was getting isolated. Yet, no one cared about this as the sight of him wearing black shorts and a white t-shirt dumbfounded them. If Felix wore sunglasses and a hat, he would undoubtedly be considered on a vacation instead of a deadly game. His casual attitude as he gave head nods to the viewers didn't make it any better. Chapter 427, The Bestial City Zone 
What the F asterisk CK is he wearing? George said speechlessly, what happened to the hoodie and sweatpants? I think he looks better this way. Sophia said, giggling. It's not a b. SHSHS, the MC is going to interview him. Their conversation was interrupted after Dallas had jumped into the ground and went straight away to Felix who was receiving some tough love from the viewers as they were cursing him left and right. When Dallas reached his side, he was surprised to see that he didn't have the damned no interviews tag on the top of his head. He honestly was just trying his luck as he figured that maybe since Felix was exposed he wouldn't reject interviews anymore. Lucky. He grinned slightly and brought out his mic. He placed in front of Felix and quickly asked, fearing that Felix might change his mind, Mr. Landlord, do you have anything to say to our dear viewers? He didn't bring the matter but he indirectly asked Felix about it. No. Felix said bluntly, pissing off the viewers immediately as they started another round of booing that almost deafened Olivia and the rest. Unbothered, Felix scratched his cheek and said, but for those flies who keep annoying me about handing the method to getting mythical bloodlines, all of you can just piss off as they don't belong to me. They are not yours. Dallas exclaimed in shock just like the rest of the players nearby and the viewers. No, now stop bothering me. Felix said while waving his hand dismissively. When Dallas tried to speak, he realized that he couldn't. Knowing why, he looked on top of Felix's head and sighed in dejection before leaving. Dallas picked another player to interview him but the viewers weren't interested in that as they were still discussing Felix's proclamation, especially the VIP viewers. Well, it was to be expected. Based on his lowly background, it is truly impossible for him to get even one mythical bloodline, don't even mention two of them. Killa said calmly while seating with another otherworldly man. He appeared to be in his late twenties but since he was seating in equal terms with Killa, the chief of the scouting crew in the Alexander Kingdom, he must be of higher status as well. Indeed, he has a provider or someone backing him. If it wasn't for so, those three superpowers wouldn't have allied with that little blue planet. The man said with a soothing tone. It's possible that those three superpowers are actually the provider but again, I doubt they would have exposed the existence of mythical bloodlines this soon if it was them. True, if it was us, we would have armed our people to the teeth until the information gets exposed. Killa said. This means that background behind landlord shouldn't be attached to any kingdom or empire. They are free to grab and we must be the first ones to get hold of it. The man said. I couldn't agree more. Killa asked, tell me general, when are your fleets arriving on earth? In the next three days. The general smiled, we will be the first to arrive and that would give us the advantage to position ourselves better than the latecomers. That reminds me. The general asked, have you spoken with that blue planet's leading power? Yes. Killa sighed, no matter what I said or offered, they refused to give us permission to enter or even a couple earthling citizens.i.p.s to some of our bloodliners. It seems like being an ally with those three superpowers has given them the guts to refuse. The general sneered, whatever, we will enter illegally and see what we can do from there on. Killa nodded his head and stopped speaking at once, focusing on Felix who was squatting on the ground with a bored expression. Thankfully, the interview segment was only 30 minutes long. When it was concluded, Dallas returned to his commentary table and snapped his finger, sending all the players outside of the stadium. When they opened their eyes, they found themselves standing between two translucent walls that were two meters in width and stretching for half a kilometer. Felix looked around him and noticed that he was placed near two players who were staring at him with unfriendly looks. Asna what are their names and strongest ability? Felix asked the Wikipedia in his mind. Um, the one on left is called Frost Gauntlet. He is known for his ability to freeze surfaces by emitting chilling airs from his hand. The other on the left is called Watermaker. He could create a medium-sized tsunami. Asna informed while sipping from a can of coke all by herself. She was lying on her side on a couch while sitting behind her were the J, 
Ramongandra and Lady Sphinx who seemed to be discussing quite an important subject based on their solemn expression. All right, thanks. After Felix got informed of their abilities, he kept them in mind and focused on the start beacon in front of the bestial city's gate. That's the only thing he could do as he realized that it was impossible to move his legs. He wasn't bothered or worried by it as he knew that all the players were frozen just like him so no one would start earlier than the rest. 10, 9, 8, 3, 2, 1, start. Boom. Following the sound of a gunshot, Felix felt that the stiffness on his legs was gone. However, instead of sprinting like the rest of the players, he simply placed his hand on his chest and called in his mind, perfect sand copy. What the hell? The players exclaimed in shock the moment they glanced behind them and saw that new versions of Felix were emerging from his palm and stand next to him. A couple of seconds later, there were more than 20 versions of Felix all hanging in the narrow path making it impossible to discern the real Felix. He is attempting to confuse the players. Dallas commentated while zooming on Felix's versions who had just started sprinting beside one copy. He was left behind squatting on the floor while scratching his cheek in boredom, appearing like the exact image of Felix from before. Is that Felix or just a copy? Olivia asked in confusion. Alas, no one answered her as they were just as confused. Thankfully, Dallas was smart enough to highlight the real Felix by placing a red arrow above his head. He is sprinting with the pack. Leo Bridge said while pointing at Felix who was in the middle of his copies. Upon seeing his expression that was exactly the same as most copies, George and the rest knew that without the red arrow, they could have never spotted him. The players who had just entered the city's gate removed any thought they had about bombarding Felix with an elemental salvo as they knew that would be a complete waste of time. Felix could literally send copies one by one through the choke, forcing them to attack his copies and escape through the smoke. By then, he could easily split his copies and make them run through the buildings in a laze, confusing them even more. Zyzyzyzyzyz. Whoosh whoosh. Yet, what made them give up on the plan entirely was the sight of four bloodlines wheezing by the gate rapidly, leaving everyone behind. One of them appeared like a lightning bolt, going so fast, his body barely was noticeable. Two more were relying on their wings and the last one was riding on a smooth silver cheetah. Speedster, Valkyrie's Cry, the Summoner, and Dream's Nocturne are trying their best to put as much distance as possible from the pack. Dallas commentated. Silver Blade Feet Of the Undying Water Slide The players didn't like that very much. Thus, they activated their passives or active abilities and chased after them fiercely, not bothering any more with Felix's station. 40 billion SC was on the line. Whoosh! Whoosh! A couple of seconds later, Felix and the rest of his copies had entered the city gate at last. Upon seeing that no one was here to welcome him, Felix smiled a little and turned on his infrared vision to the limit, giving him information about everything in two kilometers radius. Four at the front and the rest are in a pack. It seems that no one is fighting so far. Felix ignored the players and focused on the non-humanoid red auras in the city. He got to say that the city was infested with beasts as he managed to spot at least hundreds in merely two kilometers while the city's length was at least 30 kilometers from the start beacon to the finish beacon. Unbothered by being in the last rank, Felix grinned faintly while sprinting towards a gleaming metallic sky cr.p.er. His target? A thin four-legged beast that seemed to be four meters in size. Where is Landlord going? Dallas inquired with a baffled expression after switching the camera from the front runners to Felix. What is that little rascal up to now? Robert wondered just like the rest while sitting with the elders. No one seemed to know Felix's motives since the sky cr.p.er was a little bit off track. In this marathon, anything that wasn't leading to the finish beacon was off track. In a short while, Felix finally reached the skyscr.a.p.er's wide open entrance, which was leading to a clean semi-darkened lobby. Yet, 
the darkness did nothing to hinder Felix's vision from seeing the four-legged beast sitting behind the receptionist desk. It seems like the beasts were put to sleep in the first early minutes to give the players a chance to adapt to the city environment. Felix reasoned while approaching the beast openly, not trying to hide his presence or minimizing his footsteps sound. He understood that sneaking up on Tier 3 beasts was almost impossible without using abilities since their senses were heightened to the max during their sleep. A woo. As Felix thought, the instant his foot touched the beast's territory, it let out a furious roar while standing up on its paws. Immediately after the beast stepped into the light, Felix exclaimed loudly, What a fine mount! Chapter 428, Energy Management is Everything Mount Robert spew his tea at Albert while staring in shock at the four-meter wolf-like beast that had silver fur, dreadful red eyes, and saliva dripping down its fierce mouth. The Moonlight Wolf An epic tier 3 beast. Dallas asked what was on everyone's mind, is Landlord trying to kill it and copy it? Since it was impossible to mount beasts without abilities related to taming or something like that, Dallas easily concluded that Felix wanted to slay it then mount its sand copy. Felix didn't leave them wondering for long if he was going to do so or not as he swiftly dashed towards the Moonlight Wolf while having a mustard yellow bomb in his hand. The Moonlight Wolf didn't wait for Felix's arrival as it bent down and lunged at him with its jaws wide open, ready to bite off his head. Whoosh! Felix leaned to the side instantly while pushing out his bomb with his mental energy into the beast's wide open mouth. Poof! The bomb exploded simultaneously to Felix's successful dodge, as he had emerged from behind the moonlight wolf unscratched. Meanwhile, the wolf had ended up inhaling the inducement, stiffing in its place. Felix knew that the effects wouldn't last for even two seconds since the beast's poison resistance was too much for his basic poison's potency. Hence, he jumped into its back and enlarged both of his hands at once with size manipulation, then he snapped the wolf's neck in a brutal manner. Before the body could break into light particles, Felix had already activated his perfect copy. He simply extended his palm in an empty spot and sand started shaping up into the same 4 meters silver wolf. Since Felix did his very best to kill the beast without ruining his body, the copied version appeared without a scratch on it. Though, its head was a little wobbly since Felix had snapped its neck before. Too bad, there was no other method to kill it without wasting his precious time in the process. By the time the original beast had broken into light particles, Felix was already riding the copied version while pulling its neck fur to make its head always face forward. Landlord has secured a mount for himself. Dallas exclaimed, it's going to save him a lot of energy and stamina in this marathon. He wasn't lying in the slightest since it was impossible for the players to sprint from the start to the end when the distance was a hundred kilometers. This without mentioning the obstacles and the players' interferences. Hence, Felix's decision was the smartest one in this situation. Go. Whoosh. Responding to his order, the wolf bolted outside of the skyscr.a.p.er's entrance and started accelerating on the wide open empty street. With his long four legs, his speed was unattainable by the rest of the players who were sprinting on their feet without any ability. Wait a second. Dallas's eyes widened in shock after remembering something vital. He brought the microphone near his lips and asked loudly, Does Landlord's copies ever get tired? The viewers who watched Felix's fourth game were left speechless after remembering how Felix's copies were fishing constantly without a hint of exhaustion. Although that was just fishing and this was sprinting, they still believed that Felix's copies might actually never get tired since they were originally golems. Do golems get tired? No. This conclusion sent a wave of exclamations through the stadium and the stream chat as the haters kept claiming that Felix was cheating in the game while Felix's remaining fans were loving it. Ha ha ha. He will catch up in no time and even surpass them. Mr. Roger Gass clapped his hands in excitement, not caring about being in the presence of the world leaders who were sitting in the assembly hall. Some of them appeared delighted by Felix's performance while others seemed a bit gloomy. God knows why they were feeling like this since it was already decided that Felix and his close ones would be getting presidential protection. 
The moment they decided to stand behind Felix, it was only natural to go all out in doing so. Landlord is about to catch up to the slowest players in the race. Dallas's voice resounded in the hall, bringing everyone's attention to the stream. Truly, it could be seen that the Moonlight Wolf was inching closer and closer to four players who were sprinting on foot. Some of them were morphed while others were not using anything, making the viewers doubt if they had a single ability to help them race. Thud thud. Upon hearing loud footsteps behind their back, the four players turned all at once and they were left horrified by the sight of Felix grinning on top of the Moonlight Wolf. F asterisk CK this. One player didn't hesitate to turn left and bolt in a different direction, having no intentions of blocking Felix's path or being near him. The rest of the players were late by a second but they also split up and went through either building or allays, leaving the street all for Felix. Tisk. Felix clicked his tongue in irritation as he was planning on eliminating one or two for points, not giving a shit if his grandfather or Olivia were watching him. If they didn't like seeing him kill for points, then it was better for them to not watch since Felix wasn't going to act mercifully even in the individual games. Roar. Scree. Bam. Felix was forced to look behind him at the sound of an ongoing battle. Oh my, the beasts have woke up. Felix exclaimed after spotting three beasts chasing after one of the players who entered the building before. Due to Felix's infrared vision, he was able to see that the beasts didn't wake up because of the player since all of the non-humanoid auras in the area were moving rapidly towards the streets. It's time for the players to experience the first obstacle. Dallas shouted while zooming out the camera on the city and showing the viewers a sight that sent chills down their spine. Beasts were on the roofs, the sewers, and each goddamn floor on the building. The city was infested with beasts and they had finally awakened to slay the players who invaded their territory. Two kilometers away from Felix, the four fastest bloodliners in the game were forced to slow down their speed as each of them had ended up meeting two or three beasts in their path. Whoosh! Shatter! F asterisking hell, they are coming from everywhere. Dreams Nocturne cursed while diving down trying his best to evade two beasts who jumped through the building glass window without a care for their bodies. Thud thud. The moment they hit the ground, the beasts had bounced back up and chased after him even though he was clearly flying. They seemed relentless to catch him. Thank God he was on the air unlike most players, who were experiencing the same shitty experience. Everyone was either being chased or fighting for his life. The small alliances came in handy in this situation since fighting in groups made it easier to avoid getting encircled by the beasts. The marathon's rhythm has been brought down a notch. Dallas wondered while switching the camera from a player to another, who will end up faltering to the beasts. Meanwhile, Felix wasn't in the worst possible scenario since the Moonlight Wolf was helping him greatly with movement while he was left to focus on the beasts chasing him and those in front of him. Poof poof! Scurry. The beasts kept dropping into the ground while crying in pain after getting smacked by dark green bombs, a new variation that Felix had created. Their bodies got corroded while paralyzed. Adding to the mix were three mental affecting inducements to make it impossible for anyone to utilize their abilities. He called it Venomous Variation. Since it was created by merging five inducements, it was taking more energy than usual. That's why Felix used it only against beasts that were going to potentially die after hit by it. As for the rest? He simply hit them with a paralyze bomb and dash past them. Congratulations, you have earned 200 GP after slaying an uncommon Kako Koala. Congratulations, you have earned 200 GP after slaying an uncommon Night Walker Worm. Notifications kept popping in front of Felix making him realize that his venomous bombs weren't able to straightaway kill rare tier 3 beasts. As much as it saddened him, Felix decided to stop utilizing it at all since it wasn't worth it and smart to waste his energy for such a small amount of points. In this marathon, energy was everything. Landlord is still going strong amidst the chaotic streets. Dallas commentated, however. His pace is still not good enough to emerge outside of the city as part of the frontrunners. Just as Dallas mentioned, 
Speedster and the other three had been slowed but their speed was still better than the Moonlight Wolf since Felix's copies could not copy more than 20% of its strength. Speed was part of the strength, which meant unless those four had been delayed immensely, there was no way for Felix to catch up at his pace while still in the city zone. As for the sea zone? That was another matter entirely. Queen, what's my rank? Felix asked while throwing two more paralyzed bombs, clearing the path for his wolf. You are currently at 49th rank. The queen replied. Distance to the city finish beacon. 25.4 kilometers. Felix frowned his eyebrows and thought, I am going too slow. I might be able to save energy and stamina like this but it would simply keep me in the marathon but not win it. Felix glanced at the buildings around him and pushed his infrared vision to the limit. After spotting a circular red aura that clearly didn't belong to any life form, Felix nodded his head lightly and thought, it's time to take a shortcut. Chapter 429, The Earthquakes Strike Felix ordered Moonlight Wolf to change directions and head towards that building. On his way, he got ambushed by two giants golden rats from the sewers. But Felix dealt with them easily since he already saw them sneaking upon him. With his base vision, it was almost impossible to ambush him as nothing physical could skip past his eyes. Whoosh! Moonlight Wolf jumped at the wall and propelled itself towards the alley to not affect its acceleration by turning normally. The moment they entered the alley, the building with the teleportation circle had appeared at the end of it. There it is. Felix ordered, go. The moonlight dashed through the narrow alley and emerged safely to the other side. Poof poof. Felix threw two blue bombs to his right and left the moment he exited the alley. The viewers were shocked to see that his bombs had ended up connecting with two invisible green scaled snakes that hung down from light poles. How is he able to see them? Dallas exclaimed abruptly, does he still have his infrared vision? This question had set a new wave of exclamations in the stadium as no one expected that Felix was still hiding more abilities than the ones he had already shown. This is madness. What the hell is wrong with his bloodlines? Someone find him already and extract the information from him. I can't wait to get my hand on a mythical bloodline as well. Every bloodliner without an exception thought the same, even though most of them couldn't even afford legendary bloodlines. Felix didn't care about hiding his vision abilities since he was going to keep relying on them and it was almost impossible to hide the fact that he possesses them. Whoosh! Finding no obstructions, the moonlight wolf dashed through the teleportation circle and emerged on the roof of the building. The one that Felix chose was ten story tall just like the rest of the buildings connecting with it. The best part, they were leading almost straight to the beacon as there were a couple of streets that were separating the buildings. But Felix wasn't worried about that at all, as he quickly ordered for his wolf to accelerate forward. Poof poof. Felix kept helping his wolf by throwing acid bombs at the clothes that were hung on the roof to dry like the building was populated. Naturally, sometimes they get attacked by beasts who remained on the roofs. But the journey was still much smoother than sprinting on the streets since they had to always change directions to go around buildings that were blocking their paths. But now that they were on top of them, it was a straight path to the beacon. When Felix pushed his infrared vision to the limit, he managed to notice through the chaotic red auras, that more players were on the streets than the ones on the roof. That totally made sense since those teleportation circles weren't on every building but just a few. If one didn't have an ability or some good luck, he could forget about stepping on the roofs. Landlord has jumped into the 25th rank. Dallas commentated while showing the current ranking of the game on the large screen. Slash slash. 1 the Speedster. 2. Dreams Nocturne. 3. Valkyries Cry. 4. Bladator. 5. Shadow Hound. 25. Unpaid Landlord. 26. Daredevil's Life Slash Slash. Considering that Landlord's movement speed ability is heavily reliant on the sand, he is doing a terrific job. Dallas praised loudly not caring about the booze he received for supporting Felix. 
He honestly didn't give a shit about what others think of Felix as he was simply doing his job as MC slash judge and commentating unbiasedly. That's why every time Felix moved up three ranks, he made sure to switch the camera to him and commentate on his climb. By the time three minutes went by, Felix had already reached the eleventh rank. Yet, he had still to even cross half the city. This was where the moonlight wolf shone than the rest as most players that Felix had surpassed decided to slow their pace when exhaustion started hitting them. Adding the fact that beasts were obstructing their paths and Felix might actually emerge outside of the city as part of the top five. Alas, just when things were getting smoother for Felix, the game decided that it was the perfect time to introduce the second obstacle of the bestial city zone. Rumble Rumble Small tremors started spreading throughout the city, shaking smaller objects, like pebbles, glass pieces etc. Due to the chaotic and noisy atmosphere in the city, not a lot of the players felt or bothered to address those tremors as they could have been easily caused by a large beast walking or the ongoing battles. Since Felix was on traveling on the roofs, those tremors didn't reach him at all. Hence, he simply kept guiding the moonlight wolf towards the edge of a building that was looking at a wide street, separating them from the next building. By the look of it, it was almost impossible for the wolf to jump all that distance, unlike the previous times. Speed up! Felix ordered while narrowing his eyes at the edge. The moonlight listened obediently and accelerated even further by hunching slightly down. When it reached the edge, it didn't hesitate to jump into the air. He won't make it. Leader Emma and the rest of Felix's loyal fans instantly knew that the wolf and Felix were going to end up falling on the crowded street that was packed with beasts, waiting for a prey to feed on. When Dallas switched the camera focus to Felix, the screen showed that scene. Olivia, Robert and the rest of the Earthling viewers drew a deep breath at the sight. Yet, before they could feel worried for Felix, their eyes were opened widely in stupor at the sight of blue sand emerging from Felix's palms and encasing the moonlight wolf. What the hell is he doing? All the normal viewers questioned his decision as they didn't know if adding more weight was the smartest thing to do in his situation. However, the scene of descending that they were anticipating didn't happen. Instead, the moonlight wolf actually kept flying on his path like gravity wasn't working on him. Gravitational Anti-gravitational sand. The Maganda chief shouted in shock, scaring the shit out of Zazia and the rest of the anti-royalty alliance who were watching the game live in the VIP room. The Maganda chief was the quickest to know what attributed sand Felix had used since he had done some research on the blue sand when his friend brought it to him from his space exploration. He still remembers when he told his daughter Alicia about it during Felix's fourth game. He explained to her that blue sand had an anti-gravitational attribute, making it float on the air for a while before dropping down. Yet, not in his wildest dream would he have expected Felix to still show them another attributed sand. How many he does have? He wondered out loud in agitation. Zazia and the rest were half a beat late but they also saw through Felix's ingenious method of defying gravity to reach the other building. He did reach it safely as he only needed to deactivate pumping his sand domain right on top of the building. The moment the blue sand disappeared, Felix and his wolf fell into the roof. Thankfully, the wolf wasn't hurt in the process since the distance wasn't that far. Though, both of them did end up rolling on the roof due to the momentum. Thud. They ended up colliding into the other edge. Felix quickly jumped back up and patted the moonlight wolf, get up. We don't have time to laser roo. Rumble rumble. Before Felix could finish his sentence the entire building trembled like it was hit by a giant sledgehammer. Felix's footing was affected, making him drop on his knees. Shit, the earthquake is here. Felix cursed while trying to regain his balance. Alas, that was almost impossible as the building kept shaking left and right transmitting vibrations to the roof that kept forcing Felix to remain seated while clutching into the edge. When he peeked at the rest of the city, he was horrified to see that all of the buildings were shaking. Even the skyscr.a.p.ers. As for the streets? Fissures had already started to emerge on the asphalt before spreading into the building's walls. Roars, 
scree, kiki. A symphony of terrified bestial noise kept echoing in the streets as the beasts stopped bothering the players and listened to their survival instincts. It told them to get as far as possible from the city. The players who were being harassed by them were left in peace to escape the city as well or at least hide in a safe spot until the earthquake passed by. Rumble rumble. Alas, no one dared to entertain that thought anymore after the second earthquake hit. It was more brutal than the first one. Bloody hell. We need to leave this city before we get buried alive. Felix cursed while turning around. Alas, the moonlight wolf was nowhere to be seen. If Felix was paying attention or had a way to replay what happened during the first earthquake, he would have noticed that his wolf had been destroyed by the sudden vibrations. After all, it was made purely from sand and no matter how realistic it appeared, it was still sand that could be affected negatively by counters to sand. Vibrations were one of them since it separates the sand grains from each other. This is truly the worst timing for Landlord to lose his mount. Dallas wondered, how is he going to sprint towards the finish beacon before the entire city ends up in rebels? This question resounded on everyone's minds as they kept watching Felix cursing in annoyance while trying to stand up. Chapter 430, Finally in his line of sight. Unfortunately, before he regained his balance, the wall he was leaning against ended up splitting into two halves, resulting in Felix falling downward with the building's rubble from 50 meters. Felix! Olivia screamed in fear at the sight. However, before the others could even share the same worry as her, Felix had emerged from within flying rebels with merely a dirty t-shirt and messy hair. Yet, no one was focusing on those things, as they were shell-shocked by the sight of him surfing on a blue sandy path in F asterisking midair. They could see that Felix was pumping blue sand in front of him from his extended palm while bending down on it, appearing like a true surfer. He kept controlling his pathing to avoid the collapsing buildings, dodging left and right while punching other rocks aiming at his head. He is actually surfing on the sand while in the air. What the F asterisk CK is that ability? How, how is he doing that? Is that another ability? God damn it! How many ones does he have? While the viewers were pulling their hair in agitation and bewilderment at the mind-blowing sight, Dallas's thoughts were jumping around rapidly, trying his best to find out the reason and commentate on the scene. It didn't take him even a split second before connecting Felix's abilities used to create that image. He is not using a new ability but merging two abilities and one attributed sand. He commentated passionately. If he knew the abilities' names he would have used them. But his conclusion was correct as Felix was currently relying on his desert domain ability and anti-gravitational sand to create a path midair that would keep floating for at least an hour. Yet, the most important ability was actually his passive sand surfing since without it, Felix would merely be able to sprint and that was nowhere as fast as what he was demonstrating to the viewers. Felix created this combination in his training for this marathon as he was looking for ways to increase his speed in different environments. He understood that he wasn't going to be the fastest and he had to work hard to seek a path to victory. This technique was his fruit. However, it had a fatal weakness. Energy Consumption Felix could control the amount of sand he wants to emit and from which part of his body during the activation of his desert domain. But, the sand released would always remain on the field until he either leaves its range or he deactivates his ability personally. Felix couldn't do the latter since he would straightway plunge down to the ground. That's why Felix didn't plan on using it so early as he preferred keeping it until the second zone. Nevertheless, the Moonlight Wolf did a great job by crossing more than 70% of the city's own distance. There wasn't much left and Felix could finally go all out in his speed without worrying about his energy screwing him over. Rumble. Rumble. Again. Give us a break. F asterisk CK. The SKYSCR.A.P.ERS are getting affected by the third earthquake. Run. Following the emergence of the third earthquake, the players' frustrated and despaired cries resounded in the city as every one of them was using their best ability to escape the city, not caring about energy consumption or any other bullshit. 
especially when they saw that the skyscr.a.p.ers were actually trembling while long cracks were running down their walls. A moment later, glass windows started shattering one by one, raining sharp glass pieces from above on the players and beasts. Meanwhile, Felix was also getting showered from above by he didn't bother dodging those glass pieces since the blue sand had created an umbrella above him that was keeping him protected. He simply focused on the collapsing buildings in front of him, fearing that he might get buried underneath one. If only it was possible to fly hundreds of meters in the air with the anti-gravitational attributed sand, Felix would have done it in a heartbeat. Alas, his blue sand gets affected heavily the further it was from land. Even if it wasn't for this, Felix couldn't fly beyond 10 meters due to the rules enforced in this game to keep it somewhat fair for everyone. What's the point of calling an obstacles marathon when the players with flying abilities could just pass through the course from hundreds of meters in the air? One more player had been buried under the rubble. Dallas shook his head while highlighting that player's gruesome death. The reason he shook his head was because the player had been ambushed by another player after he saw that he was heavily wounded. This showed that everyone and everything was aiming to get to you in the city and that the players would not hesitate to take advantage of one's misfortune even in this situation. Let's see how our frontrunners are coping. Dallas switched the camera quickly to the four frontrunners and realized that three of them were only three kilometers away from the beacon while the fourth one was lagging behind. If he had to guess, he would say that they would exit the city in under one minute. When he switched to Felix, he saw that he still had five kilometers between him and the beacon. However, with his new method of racing, his speed had increased substantially and Dallas had believed that Felix could cross that distance in under three minutes. This meant he was behind the front runners by only two minutes. The best part, his energy pool was still full, unlike the front runners who must have lost 30% already if they were using abilities. Even if they were using mutations, they would still get physically tired. Crash. Shatter. The hell? Is the city built from paper? Felix couldn't help but complain after seeing a couple of skyscr.a.p.ers submit to nature, falling into the ground. Some fell horizontally without creating too much mess while some fell to the side, scaring the shit of the players and beasts who were in their path. Thankfully, the players were fast enough to leave the contact area. When Felix focused in front of him and saw the shaking skyscr.a.p.ers blocking his path, he couldn't help but dread that one of them would end up falling now or after he passed by them. The worst part, he couldn't really go around them since that would delay him immensely and he might still end up being near another sky cr.a.p.er. After all, the city was full of them appearing just like downtown New York. I need to speed past them before they fall apart. After making his decision, Felix bent down even further to reduce wind resistance. He also stopped attacking the flying rocks and such, leaving his blue sand to take of it. Just like a guardian, the sand kept slapping away every projectile without affecting Felix's speed. Landlord is speeding to the beacon through 3 skyscr.a.p.ers. Dallas zoomed out on Felix, putting him as well as the shaking 3 skyscr.a.p.ers in a single frame. That allowed the viewers to see from above Felix's safe emergence from 2 skyscr.a.p.ers. Olivia and the rest sighed in relief at the sight and couldn't help but cheer afterward as they could see that it was almost a smooth journey to the beacon from there on. Due to Landlord's Balsa move, he managed to secure the 6th R. Rumble. Before Dallas could finish his proclamation, he ended up jinxing it as those three skyscr.a.p.ers had all collapsed at once. One of them could be seen collapsing on itself but the other two were falling sideways. The viewers ignored the one that was falling in the opposite direction of Felix and placed their unwarranted attention on the last skyscr.a.p.er that was falling over Felix. Since he was only 10 meters above ground, the skyscr.a.p.er had darkened the sky for Felix. If it wasn't for its destroyed glass windows, not a single ray of light would have reached him. F asterisk CK me. Knowing that it was impossible to outrun its collapse, 
Felix waved his extended palm to the left, creating a blue sandy path that was leading outside of the skyscr.a.p.er's range. Whoosh whoosh! Thud! Desks, chairs, tables, and the rest of the furniture inside the skyscr.a.p.er were raining from above on Felix. They were exiting from the wide open windows of each floor. There were hundreds of them, making Felix having a tough time evading everything while also keeping up his speed. Thankfully, his blue sand was constantly punching out those objects, relieving him from the stress of dealing with everything at once. You can do it Felix. Asna cheered him on as she could hear that his heart was beating out of his chest while his thoughts had nothing but a pragmatic view of the clearest path to safety. His golden pupils had already been expanded to the limits, marking his constant activation of first class. E.M.E.NT. In this deadly situation, Felix was relying on the ultraviolet vision as it allowed him to see everything in almost white and black, removing those annoying colors, sun rays, etc., from affecting his vision. Where is he? Dallas yelled while leaning closer to his table mic. His sudden shout was understandable as the camera had ended up losing sight of Felix due to the chaotic situation. This left everyone furious and also distressed about what's going on. Was Felix going to make it outside? They all thought. Boom. Shatter. Alas, the sky cr.a.p.er had ended up reaching the ground raising a humongous cloud of dust. Yet, Felix was nowhere to be seen. Before anyone could react to the situation, a gleaming blue light had broken out from the dust cloud. The camera instantly focused on it, making the viewers exclaim in astonishment at the sight of a giant blue sphere that was withdrawing slowly. When the sand finally returned to its original place, Felix was exposed in the open, showing his dirty face, hair, and clothes that were already slightly ripped apart. Regardless of his shitty appearance, the viewers were drawn to his confident smirk as he simply placed one hand in his shorts pocket and kept the other extended, creating a path to the beacon. Hoa! As always! Landlord never fails to demonstrate his resolve to gaining victory. Dallas commentated passionately. Yet, this time the viewers didn't all explode in cheers as they were still hating on Felix and no matter how amazing his plays appeared, they weren't going to show a single ounce of support. Though, his loyal fans didn't hesitate to show their support by chanting his name as loud as possible. Meanwhile, Felix's heart was about to leap out of his throat from fright. That C.O.C.K.Y. smirk was merely a front as he was truly scared shitless from getting engulfed in the rubble. Although he knew that he wouldn't die, he was still would be badly wounded. In this marathon, getting wounded was the same as giving up on the game. If this was merely the first zone, I wonder how hellish the second and third one would be. Felix narrowed his eyes, I am currently at 6th rank and if I managed to reach the damnation desert while staying this close to the frontrunners, it's going to be my win. The moment that thought resounded in his mind, Felix had emerged outside of the city's gate and was met with the sight of a peaceful sea that had a bridge made out of large separated boulders. When he focused deeply on the horizon, he noticed five little black dots either flying or jumping on those boulders. The front runners were finally within his eyesight. Chapter 431, The Peaceful Sea Zone Felix didn't bother to even glance at the boulders bridge as he did the unexpected by lying down on his blue sandy path. While he was lying down on his stomach, he had his arm extended forward, continuing to pump out blue sand without an issue. Whoosh! Landlord's speed had further increased yet again. Dallas commentated, it seemed like the peacefulness of the sea is the perfect place to pull off this posture. Everyone was smart enough to realize that relying on this posture in the city was nothing but asking for trouble. However, in this zone? Felix is kept wheezing by unhindered, bridging the gap slightly every second. If only those bastards were fighting each other. Felix cursed while focusing on the five frontrunners, who were too close to each other yet no one was throwing a single ability. He figured out that it was highly likely for them to be in alliance. He didn't know its terms but he believed that none of them would turn on each other until the last five kilometers or two kilometers. Queen, show me the ranking. 
Felix requested. Slash slash. 1. Valkyrie's Cry. 2. Dreams Nocturne. 3. The Speedster. 3. Shadow Hound. 4. Bladator. 5. The Summoner. 6. Unpaid Landlord. 7. The Last Soul. 39. Holy Grail slash slash. So 39 players are still alive. Felix thought while glancing behind him. Immediately after, he noticed that a pack of players was chasing after him from distance away. It appeared that most of them were totally fine as their speed was still good enough to keep them in the marathon. No one was weirded out by this as everyone had figured out that the earthquakes and building collapsing might sound like the apocalypse but for peak second stage bloodliners, it would not get them killed that easily. If it wasn't for so, the game wouldn't have included those disasters as they had no intentions of massacring everyone right off the bat. The only reason the rest of the players died was either due to the beasts or other players interfering in their escape and survivability. They wouldn't be a problem to me. Felix focused back in front and requested, Asna remind me of those five players' abilities. Asna munched on a snack while informing him about their abilities. It took her a short while to finish since she had to give a short explanation of each ability. Felix still remembers a couple of abilities but not all of them. They should slow down eventually. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to reach the finish line. Felix reasoned this based on their information as Asna had told him that their speed was based on abilities and not a mutation. This meant, their elemental energy was the one taking the hit instead of their stamina. Since they had entered some fights with beasts on their way to the beacon, it was expected that it wouldn't be enough to let them sprint from the start to the end. Hence, Felix simply kept chasing behind them, waiting patiently for them to slow down. The marathon had entered a stalemate. Dallas asked with a faint smile, but for how long? Seconds went by then minutes, the players had already crossed a couple of kilometers on the sea or under the sea, yet no sight of land could be seen. Everyone was slowly getting agitated as they knew that the sea peacefulness wouldn't last forever. If the timing of the disaster was the same as the city zone, then it should be happening right now. Hence, Felix kept vigilance to the max, focusing mostly in front of him and at the sides, knowing that it was impossible for the tsunami to strike from behind. Sure enough, a long black line had emerged in the horizons, making Felix narrow his eyes and focus at it. A couple of seconds later, that line got bigger and continued to grow in Felix's eyesight until his heart skipped a beat after knowing that it was finally here. The first obstacle of the second zone is here. The Great Tsunami. Dallas shouted while extending his hand at the screen that wasn't showing the players but a towering tsunami, reaching at least 500 meters in height. It was even taller than the Empire State Building making it possible for this tsunami to fully drawn out New York City if it got hit. Holy shit! How the hell are they going to survive that? Ha ha ha, this is too exhilarating. Switch the camera to the players. I want to see their expressions. Dallas didn't need to be told by the viewers as he had split the camera into two, showing both the tsunami and the players. By now, the tsunami was visible to even the players behind Felix. Hence, their expressions were priceless when they realized that they were literally in the middle of nowhere while getting stormed by almost half a kilometer tsunami. When Dallas told them about the sea zone obstacles, he mentioned tsunamis. But they never expected that it was going to have such a horrifying size that would put other tsunamis to shame. Yet, before they lost their cool, they looked at the large boulders and their eyes brightened up. They instantly figured out that the boulders must be strong enough to withstand the tsunami's power since the game wasn't going to leave them without a way out. Thus, every player had rushed to secure one boulder for himself. Felix also dropped down to the biggest boulder near him and quickly tested its hardness by hitting it with his enlarged tail. Thud. The noise produced was loud all right but the results were satisfactory as the boulder's surface only ended receiving tiny cracks that were not even an inch long. Upon seeing so, Felix hastily climbed down to the boulder's base that was way thicker than its peak. Then, he snapped a finger, 
forcing out pitch black sand from his pores. He quickly controlled them by mental energy to encase himself with the boulder. Landlord is not taking any chances. Dallas said, he decided to add another layer of protection. For those who don't know, that black sand is ten times tougher than normal sand. Not much reacted to the information since by now, the news of Felix's three known attributed sand had already been out in public for months. Hence the moment Felix used his black sand, his intentions were understood. But, he ended up still surpassing their expectations as Felix took another step and hardened his black sand with his hands and legs still clasping into the boulder. That made him get instantly affixed in his place without having his head and torso getting affected. That should be more than enough to survive it. Felix thought while stopping releasing sand. He had full control of when to release or stop. But if he decided to deactivate it, everything would disappear. Let's check on others. Felix turned on his infrared and X-ray vision and focused on the five front runners. He saw that all of them were somewhat in the same position as him, hanging in the air. He couldn't see exactly what abilities or strategies they used to reinforce their defense, but he felt that it wasn't going to be as good as him. After all, Speedster was a lightning elementalist while Valkyrie was a wind elementalist and the rest also had elements related to movement speed or offense, unlike Felix's sand element. Only the summoner was a metal elementalist and Felix felt that he shouldn't be affected as badly as the others. There is a high chance that most of them will end up thrown underwater. That might not kill them but it will definitely delay them immensely. Felix smirked faintly, that would be my chance to catch up to them or even surpass them. Hoosh whoosh. Felix's thought process was interrupted by the raging sound of the wind, making him feel like he was nearby a tornado. This was an indication that the great tsunami was right upon them. Neither Felix nor the player knew its exact position due to the boulder hindering their vision. But the viewers were fully aware of what was going on and they couldn't help but either cheer or pray for their idol's safety. The great tsunami is about to reach the front runners. Dallas stood up and stared deeply at the five players who were each using a unique method to clasp tightly to the boulder. But when the tsunami towered over them like a god, even the players themselves didn't believe that was going to be enough. Shit. Shit shit. Speedster kept cursing with cold sweat coursing all over his body. He already stopped looking at the tsunami as he made sure to close his eyes and affix his head with the boulder to not freak himself. The rest could only do the same because they knew that if they saw the tsunami now, their hearts would probably stop beating. 30 meters, 20 meters, 10 meters, splosh. Everything had been engulfed inside the tsunami's belly making it impossible for the viewers to see if the front runners had been cast away or were still holding the boulder. But Dallas was prepared for this as he made sure to highlight the players' bodies with a red aura. This shocked the viewers alike as they had noticed three red bodies flailing randomly while inside the tsunami that had yet to stop. They appeared like they had been caught in the current without any way to save themselves out of it. When Dallas highlighted the names of those caught, their idols let out despairing cries as they knew that the game was over for them. The C.O.C.KY speedster was one of them, sure, he was the fastest on the ground, but this wasn't a race but an obstacle marathon. Only those who prevailed to the finish line had a shot at emerging victorious. Splosh splosh! Before long, the great tsunami reached the pitch black boulder where Felix was taking cover. Without lifting his head, Felix knew that it was upon him, literally. Olivia, Robert and the rest held their breaths in nervousness while staring without a blink at the tsunami that was only a couple of meters away from Felix. Before they could pray for his survival, the pitch black boulder had disappeared out of sight just like the rest. Against Mother Nature, everyone was equal to her wrath and it was time for Felix to have a small taste. Chapter 432, The Great Tsunami Meanwhile, inside the tsunami, Felix kept holding his breaths even though he still had melon fins to breathe underwater. He understood that the tsunami would pass by in 30 seconds max and there was no need to breathe in water in such a situation. As for his boulder? It wasn't cracked at all since the hardened pitch black sand took the brunt of the collision, resulting in it getting destroyed from the front. 
but the back was still safe, allowing Felix to stay affixed with the boulder. 14, 15, 16. Felix kept counting from the moment he got hit, wanting to give himself some indications of the tsunami's current position. So he could move the moment he was out of its range instead of waiting until it reached the shores. When he counted to 30 seconds, he realized that the water pressure on him had been reduced immensely, making him able to move his head without an issue. It's time to make a move. Without an ounce of hesitation, Felix deactivated his desert domain which ended up turning all of his sand into particles, freeing him in the process. However, he was still clasping tightly on the boulder's surface, not wanting to let go now. He felt that he would be swept away with the tide the moment he released himself. But, instead of remaining in his position, he began climbing to the boulder's peak one step at a time. When he reached the top, he waited there until the pressure gets reduced even more. Since he was at the peak of the boulder, he was finally able to see in front of him and scout the situation of the front runners. Whoosh! Whoosh! The moment he peeked with his X-ray vision, he was shocked to find out that only two skeletons remained affixed in their positions. The other three? They were gone. They must have gotten swept away. Felix reasoned while trying to turn his head and glance behind him. When he pulled it off, he grinned slightly at the sight of three skeletons getting taken away with the current. Lucky for them, they weren't in the boulder's path. Otherwise, they would have been gravely injured after they collide with one. Still, Felix believed that their winning chance in the game had diminished to the bottom as it was almost impossible to bridge the gap again when the tsunami ends up pushing them back to the shore. A couple of seconds later, Felix lifted his head and focused on the water surface after feeling that the tension had further reduced. I can swim upward now. Felix nodded his head firmly and called in his mind, size manipulation, body x10. Tail remains the same. He chose this combination so his tail's bulgy end wouldn't add to his weight and act as an anchor. The moment his body grew to its desired size and shape, Felix immediately let go of the boulder and swam rapidly to the surface. However, he still underestimated the current since he felt like he was swimming against the current of a waterfall. He kept pushing upward while the current tried to pull him with the tsunami that was already 2 to 3 kilometers away from him. Even leaving his tail with its normal size wasn't enough. I need more. X16. Uncaring about his energy consumption, Felix called loudly in his mind. Immediately after, his body size had grown even bigger, giving him more weight but most importantly more strength to push himself upward. In his present state, he should be having at minimum 10 kbf, a huge increase to his original strength that was equivalent to only 4 kbf. What the hell? Dallas exclaimed in shock the moment he glanced at Felix's small screen that was showing him continuing to swim upward with the size of the biggest whale on Earth. He quickly switched the camera from the tsunami, which was about to smash the pack of players, to Felix. Just as the viewers wanted to curse for his abrupt switch, their jaws were dropped in disbelief after spotting that Felix was daring enough to fight against the current. How did he become this big? I watched his fourth game and he was only half the size of his current state. Can he f asterisking grow to infinity or what? Maganda Chief and the rest of the Anti-Royalty Alliance couldn't help but lose their shit and comment noisily in their room. Just as they thought that Felix was out of tricks and had shown them the full potential of his bloodlines, he shocks them once again and makes them doubt their eyes. The rest of the VIP viewers reacted the same. Relax. I doubt he could grow to infinity. Zazia let out a long breath and said calmly, it must have a limit. He could grow possibly to 30 meters or even 40 meters if we decided to be generous. But he can't grow any more than that. True, mythical ability or not, there is always a limit or a range to them. Maganda chief agreed with a head nod while gazing at Felix who was about to reach the surface. I believe that the energy consumption isn't a joke for such an ability. Gabrielle added, otherwise, he wouldn't have been saving it always for dire situations. Still, this just reinforced our belief that mythical bloodlines abilities are the best of the best. Maganda Chief said, 
after the game, contact Landlord and push him gently to contact the organization for us. The royal family isn't brain dead to see all of this and not make a move. So we need to secure them quickly. Agreed. Let me do it. Zazia said. After hearing so, the Alliance stopped discussing the matter at once and focused on Felix who had finally emerged from the surface. Splush. The instant Felix's giant head emerged from the water, he extended both of his palms upward and spew a magnificent torrent of blue sand. An amount unimaginable with his normal body size. A moment later, Felix deactivated his size manipulation as he could feel that his energy was getting sapped way too fast. Immediately after his size returned to normal, Felix pushed his desert domain to the limit by making every pore in his body release the blue sand. Naturally, since he was in the water, most of the sand was wasted but those coming out of his head, shoulders, arms, and lastly hands, barely touched the water. Before the viewers could comprehend what he was going for, they were awed to see him being lifted slowly in the air until his entire body had emerged safely. The blue attributed sand had pulled him out of the sea's clutches. He is out. Dallas shouted excitedly, he actually got out. While some viewers might not understand his excessive excitement, the rest understood that what Felix had pulled up shouldn't have happened in this game unless one had terrific underwater-related abilities. Dallas understood that the Great Tsunami was designed in this game to force the players into hiding behind the boulders until it passes. Then, they could resume their marathon. Those who got swept away after losing their grip would end up on the shore and retry again to pass through this zone. Yet, Felix literally just said F asterisk CK that and emerged while the sea hadn't been pacified. Upon seeing that he was the only one standing in the air while completely drenched, everyone knew that he had at least 30 seconds of free pass to accelerate while the rest could only wait until the sea calmed down. Those willing to risk it are always rewarded. Dallas shouted passionately, Landlord is about to receive his reward. Whoosh! Felix didn't waste time appreciating the view of the tsunami engulfing everything in its path as he quickly laid down on the blue sandy path and streaked up close to the water. He was fast enough he caused small waves to appear on the water surface. Even though no one was in front of him, Felix kept scouting those two frontrunners' situation. Upon noticing that both of them were still holding for their dear life, Felix smiled faintly and switched his vision behind him. Ha, the rest is doomed to catch up. Felix stopped paying them any attention after seeing that there were more than five kilometers between them. Worst of all, it was still increasing since he was on the move while they weren't. Felix is pulling ahead from the pack while at the same time getting closer and closer to the front runners. George smiled widely and said, if he managed to reach them before they emerge, the game will end in his favor. Noah and the rest nodded their heads in agreement and continued watching Felix bridge the distance to merely 600 meters or so. However, just when it seemed like Felix was going to reach and even surpass those two, everyone was shocked to see that a dark shadow had emerged from the sea and a winged woman escapes to the surface as well. The winged woman could be seen engulfed inside a giant grey aura that was shaped up like an arrow making the viewers believe that she had penetrated straight to the surface. Meanwhile, they had no idea how the dark shadow escaped but they still cheered loudly for them as they wanted nothing more but to see Felix lose. Chapter 433, and another one. Dreams Nocturne and Valkyrie's Cry have decided to emerge after the tsunami reached a couple of kilometers away from them. Dallas commentated loudly. Their fans screamed in excitement at the sight as they had truly believed that their idols weren't going to emerge until the sea turned peaceful again. But it seemed like those two weren't any pushovers as they managed to achieve Felix's feat. Though it was much easier for them since the tsunami had reached them first. Thus, when they emerged, the tsunami was way further, causing the current to be much peaceful than when Felix attempted to break through. Plus, they both had wings allowing them to fly above the water without needing the boulder. Meanwhile, the last players who remained hugging his boulder probably wanted to emerge as well but he had no ability to keep himself in the air. Whatever, I have already bridged the distance. Felix didn't react much to their emergence as he simply stood back on his feet, 
returning to his original surfing posture. He had to do so since he was expecting retaliation when he gets too close to them. Bloody hell, how did he reach this far? Valkyrie exclaimed in shock and terror after she turned around and noticed that Felix was surfing on the blue sandy path towards them. Since it was impossible to go beyond 10 meters above any surface, all three of them were flying at the same height. This made it easier to spot each other even though the distance between them was in the hundreds of meters. I am not waiting to receive that devil. Dreams Nocturne sent a message while flapping his darkened demonic wings rapidly. Upon receiving his message, Valkyrie stopped paying Felix any attention and chased after Nocturne, fearing for her life. She was fully clear about her strengths and weaknesses. Hence, she understood that fighting against Felix was a death wish, and the only way to win this game was by pushing through her limits and reaching the finish line before him. Let the hunt begin. Asna laughed evilly while eyeing those two like they were flying corpses. She expected that Felix would close the half-kilometer gap in no time and kill them, but the end result was far from that as minutes went by and Felix barely closed the distance by 40 meters. The tsunami had already ended and the players could be seen like tiny dots chasing behind him. The speedster who was left behind due to his lack of flight abilities was using all he got to jump from a boulder to another, hoping to catch up to Felix and the rest. Too bad. He might be the best runner in leveled land due to his lightning speed boost but in this zone, he wasn't really outperforming himself. Meanwhile, a couple of players had taken the underwater route, swimming with fish-like morphing abilities. They were actually ahead of the pack. But, they were still slower than Felix and those two front runners, since a fish could never outspeed a bird. This made the game enter the second stalemate as each one was chasing after the other without random fights between them. Seconds went by then minutes, kilometers were crossed and the horizon had finally turned into a visible land. Queen, distance to the third zone. Felix asked after noticing it. Five kilometers give or take. Weird, we are about to arrive but there is no second obstacle. Felix frowned his eyebrows at the thought. Based on Dallas's words, each zone had two obstacles. So, it was expected that they should have experienced another in the past minutes. But, they were getting closer and closer to the land, yet still there was no sight of it. Four kilometers, three kilometers, two kilometers. The land had already expanded in their line of vision, making them see the spacious grass field but not the desert after it. Shit. We are about to enter that demon's favorite environment while he is too close to us. Valkyrie's cry sent a message to her ally while glancing behind her in worry. I don't know about you but I am planning to go all out in my speed when I reach the grass field. Dreams Nocturne informed, I just need to create a long distance between us and he might not even reach or touch me in the desert. But, if you did so, you wouldn't have enough energy to do one last sprint to the finish line. Valkyrie's cry sent a message. I would rather lose in the last sprint than get caught by him in the desert. Dreams Nocturne said, it is already hard enough to deal with the desert beasts and sandstorms. Valkyrie's cry went quiet after hearing so. She understood his reasoning and realized that he might be right. At this instant, winning should be considered only after they feel safe. But with Felix breathing down their necks, that wasn't happening anytime soon. I am doing so as we, wait, am I seeing things or the water is increasing in front of us? Valkyrie sent a message while edging her head closer in front to see the ongoing peculiarity. She could see that the water near the land was rising slowly. Dreams Nocturne also noticed this and knitted his eyebrows, could it be? He had a guess but he didn't dare to believe it. Alas! the sea didn't care about his thoughts as it kept rising up and up until a medium-sized wave had been created. By now, even Felix knew what was about to come and got into his surfing posture with a solemn expression. The second tsunami has emerged. Dallas commentated excitedly while zooming out on the front runners until the tsunami had joined the frame. Seeing how it was still rising while heading towards the players, the viewers knew that a second wave of players was going to be sent packing. Truly, some players within the pack had an ugly expression at the sight. 
although they knew that the tsunami wouldn't be as strong as the last one due to the distance. Still it was going to be tough to survive it since their energy and stamina had already started taking a toll on them. How were they supposed to keep hanging to the boulder when their body was semi-exhausted? While the pack were worrying about this, the frontrunners had different thoughts entirely. We can speed past it before it gets too high for us. I am going all out right now. Dreams Nocturne left this message behind while manifesting two smaller demonic wings right above his rear. The moment they emerge, they started flapping with the main wings, increasing his speed substantially, pulling away from Valkyrie's cry and Felix. Dreams Nocturne is attempting to fly over the tsunami while it is still small. Dallas shouted, can he pull it off? Before the viewers could cheer for him, Valkyrie's cry accompanied him in his attempt as she had also gone all out in her speed to pass over the tsunami. She had covered herself in that arrow-like aura that helped her penetrate the wind like a real pointy arrow. Only Felix was left behind. Unlike them, he didn't have any other secret way to increase his speed. He was currently flying at his best acceleration and he could only watch them pulling away from him. Damn it, if they succeeded in passing over it while I hug the boulder, it's game over for me. Felix understood that it was going to be impossible to bridge the gap if that happens since he would have given them at least a minute as a head start. This meant unless both of them ended up getting heavily hindered in the desert, the game would conclude with his loss. Felix had no intentions of relying on luck to help him win this game. I can do it as well. Felix knitted his eyebrows while lifting his head, staring deeply at the tsunami that had grown already past 200 meters, appearing like a monster ready to devour all things alike. By now, only the three of them were still on the move as the rest of the players had already latched into a boulder to protect themselves. While Dreams Nocturne and Valkyrie were almost under the tsunami and about to attempt climbing over it, Felix was still hundreds of meters away. However, he didn't flinch or tremble in fear at the apocalyptic scene that would turn any commoner's legs into jelly. He simply narrowed his eyes in focus and kept going at his fastest speed. He understood that even if he failed to go over it, he wouldn't really die since he could simply turn around and surf on it until it reaches the shore and disappears. Though, if that happens, it's a game over for him as he would be placed with the last players. But he would rather end up losing like that than hope for a lucky strike to help him win the game. They are going to make it. Felix concluded after noticing that both Dreams Nocturne and Valkyrie's cry had already traveled half the tsunami while its arch hadn't been manifested yet. He understood that curve or arch was the only thing that was going to stop them and him from passing over it. That's because the players were able to only fly 10 meters past any surface. This entailed that it was possible to fly horizontally with the tsunami but impossible to do so if it had a moon-like curve extending outward. That's why no one bothered to attempt and pass over the first tsunami since it had already been developed to its maximum height and already had a curve. Though, it seemed that the game had made the tsunami unable to fall on them even though it reached its peak so the players wouldn't get killed when it fall over their heads. They did it. Good shit Nocturne. Haha. <laughs> that bastard's loss is secured now. I can't wait to see his expression. As expected. Those two had gone past it successfully under the cheers of Dallas and the viewers. Their speed and close distance made it appear easier than it should have been. It's Landlord's turn. Is he going to achieve the same or flop? Dallas tightened his fists and said eagerly, I for one can't wait to find out. Chapter 434, Risk It or Lose the Game Meanwhile, Olivia and the rest of the team were already standing on their feet while having their wide-opened eyes affixed on Felix who appeared as tiny as an ant in front of the towering tsunami. They could see that he had already reached the bottom of it and was beginning the climb. He was keeping merely five meters away from the surface, making it extremely hard to notice his blue sandy path due to the color being the same as the water. This made Felix appear from that frame like he was truly surfing on the tsunami but upward going against the current. But when Dallas zoomed in the camera on him, that illusion was gone as the screen started displaying his serious and focused expression. It didn't seem like it was a fun experience as the raging wind was making his messy golden hair flail around, hindering his vision. 
water drops kept landing on his drenched clothes that were sticking to his defined and firm muscles. When those drops land on his face, Felix merely ignores them, keeping his entire focus placed on the peak of the tsunami that had yet to shape up an arch. But, everyone knew that would happen soon since the tsunami had already reached 400 meters in height. Based on the first time, it looked to everyone that the tsunami was limited to only 500 meters as it couldn't really grow to infinity. This meant the tsunami would grow for another 100 meters before forming an arch and dooming Felix to lose the game. Seeing that he had just crossed half of it, the viewers weren't too optimistic about his chances. Surprisingly, Felix also calculated that based on his current speed, it was almost impossible to cross 200 meters before the arch forms. At least some of it. What do I do? Instead of letting the news affect him negatively, Felix started brainstorming for a method to help him pass over the upcoming arch. He already gave up on increasing his speed any further since the raging wind was going against him, making it impossible to even reach his previous peak speed. Asna, the J, Ramungandr, and Lady Sphinx, all perked up their ears and listened to his thoughts in intrigue, wanting to know how would he solve his problem. Upon hearing the crazy ideas that were swimming quickly in his brain, they looked at each other and laughed together. Felix didn't even hear their laughter as he quickly picked a plan with the highest success rate and started acting on it. Guardians of the Temples, Eagle Guardian Emerge Felix called in his mind while extended his other palm in front of him. Pitch black sand was projected tens of meters in the air without dropping. That's due to Felix's mental control. But since the Eagle Guardian was 8 meters tall, Felix's mental energy was draining rapidly to keep him from falling. But the moment the Eagle Guardian had been shaped up, Felix let him drop on the blue sandy path while using his mental energy to pull him. Felix had sand surfing passive, but the Eagle Guardian didn't. That meant, he would end up getting left behind if Felix ever relaxed his control. As usual, the Eagle Guardian did his greeting ritual even in this situation, making the tenants in Felix's mind laugh out loud at the amusing scene. What is Landlord up to? Dallas shouted with a baffled tone, he is just slowing himself down by adding that giant golem. Truly, Felix's speed had been lowered by a notch, making everyone confused by his decision to summon the Eagle Guardian. Felix didn't bother about how he was perceived as he simply kept surfing close to the tsunami that was already showing signs of curving from the top. At the start, it was barely noticeable but the moment Felix reached 450 meters, the sky darkened upon Felix due to the arch blocking off the sun rays from his reaching him. Yet, instead of feeling agitated, Felix ordered calmly in his mind, Eagle throw me through the arch. The Eagle Guardian didn't think twice before clutching Felix in his giant hand and hurling him like a cannonball. Whoosh! Felix removed his mental control immediately after he got thrown, making the Eagle Guardian break out of his control and remain on the blue sandy path that was in the process of breaking into blue particles. Splush! The entire sequence happened so fast, the viewers could only watch Felix fly in the air with a dumbstruck expression. Since the camera was zoomed on him, they saw that he was flying in a straight posture with his hands extended in front of him while tightly clasped together, appearing like a swimmer jumping for a quick dive. His destination. The tip of the tsunami's arch. Splush. Before they could even think if he was going to make it to the other side or not, Felix had already penetrated the arch, disappearing out of sight. Deathly silence had fallen in the stadium and the stream as more than a hundred billion viewers all over the galaxy was watching the other side of the arch while holding their breaths. A second later, splash. A fully drenched Felix had emerged behind the tsunami exactly the same as he entered, appearing like a human missile. Water accompanied him in the air as he flew a couple of meters due to the remaining momentum. The camera captured him right when the sun rays had shone over him making his wet golden hair gleam for a split second just like the drops of water that were dripping down his body. Felix jerked his hair to the side, exposing his face that had the same C.O.C.KY smirk every time his plan had turned successful. Whoosh! Alas, 
gravity had to ruin the moment as Felix's body began descending back to the tsunami after he reached his peak height. Felix stopped smirking and quickly snapped his finger, creating a cloud of blue sand that helped him stop his descent. Then, he extended his palm forward and started pumping more blue sand to create another blue path. This time it was a path straight to victory as the only remaining zone was the damnation desert. Once again. The daredevil had pulled IT off. Thrilled and agitated, Dallas yelled at the mic with spit flying everywhere, hyping up the stadium and stream even more. Landlord. 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 Leader Emma and the rest of the fan club all broke into deafening chants with their cheeks flushed red in excitement and exhilaration. They didn't care how others perceived Felix or how much they hated him for keeping vital information to himself. The only thing that mattered to them was supporting their idol wholeheartedly. Robert, the Maxwell family, the council, the Earthling team, and every Earthling who was watching the game with them reacted in the same manner, as cheers had broken out in each place. Brother Felix is so cool. Olivia said, laughing in pure happiness. Johnson and the rest nodded their heads in agreement while showing a hint of envy in their eyes at Felix's performance. They also wanted to take part in such a big stage and be viewed by hundreds of billions of viewers. Alas, they didn't have the guts to join the individual games since they were ten times riskier than planetary games. At least in planetary games, they have teammates to support and help them. Plus, there was the surrender option. They knew that they weren't built to reach the same heights as Felix in the individual games and if they ever tried to repeat his achievements, they would end up dying in their first game. Although they envied him, they were still happy that he was in their team as that meant they would be able to win the upcoming games by a landslide, earning them profit and also helping the planet to climb higher on the ladder. Impossible. Why is he still behind us? Their thought process was broken by the shocked and agitated voice of Valkyrie after the camera had switched to her and Dream's Nocturne. Dallas wanted to see their reaction after they noticed that Felix was still glued behind him like a piece of gum in their hair. Shit. 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 He is going too fast. Dream's Nocturne's expression darkened when he spotted Felix's speed that was at least double their current speed. Clearly, it wasn't because Felix had magically managed to find a way to increase it but simply because those two were forced to slow down since their energy was already below 20%. This was due to them going full ham in the first zone to create as much distance as possible from the pack. When they reached the second zone, they were planning on reducing their pace since they were already 3 kilometers away from the rest. However, Felix's emergence had changed this as he forced them to keep going at their fastest speed so he wouldn't catch up to them. The only difference between them was that Felix had consumed way less energy and still had plenty in his tank to keep the same fast pace. Although he wasted a ton by using size manipulation, Felix still had the purified emergency tank unlike them. That's why Felix was fully confident in his chance to win the game if he kept being at the front runner. If it wasn't for so he wouldn't have gone all out to fly over the tsunami. I am increasing my pace. We don't know how much energy he still has but it wouldn't be too far from ours. Dreams Nocturne informed with an ugly expression. Valkyrie nodded her head and started flapping her wings faster, chasing after him. The reason they were losing more energy every time they increased their speed was that most wing abilities consume energy every second. That consumption depends on the current state of the wings, if they were dormant, the energy consumption would be at the bare minimum. If they were hyperactive, more fuel would be consumed. Because the consumption was based on elemental energy, their stamina wasn't really affected by it, making them not feel exhaustion at all. However, if those wings were based on a mutation and not an ability, they wouldn't consume elemental energy but the users would sure feel physically tired when they keep flying for an extended period of time. Hence, pace and energy management were important in both cases. Too bad, Felix wasn't giving them the opportunity to do that with his massive energy pool. Dreams Nocturne and Valkyrie are one kilometer away from Landlord. Dallas said loudly, but the grass field is right in front of them and beyond it is the desert. 
Can all three of them manage to survive it with their reckless energy management? Chapter 435, Semi-God in the Desert The camera switched to what lays in front of Nocturne Dreams, making the viewers see the peaceful and soothing grass field like it was taken from paradise itself. A huge contrast to the raging sea in front of it and the dreadful desert behind it. It was like a piece of land that was meant to bait the players into giving up. However, when those three reached it, they didn't even spare the grass a glance as they continued flying towards the desert. This half zone wasn't made for frontrunners but for the players at the last place who knew that it was impossible to win the game. Instead of hanging around in those two dangerous zones, it was much better to stay in the grass field until the game ends. Some time later, Dreams Nocturne and Valkyrie had officially stepped inside the peaceful golden desert that resembled any regular one. There were golden dunes that were big enough to be called mounds A and D. That's all. Only dunes and sand stretched to the horizon. If it wasn't for a beacon of light that was shining brightly at the other side of the desert, Dreams Nocturne and Valkyrie wouldn't have known where was the finish line at. Whoosh! Finally, I am here. Felix laughed in elation the moment he crossed to the desert. Without further ado, Felix dropped into the golden sand after deactivating his desert domain. There was no need to create a path when the entire desert was his playground. The hell is that posture? The viewers were left speechless when they saw him placing his bulgy tail's end on the sand while he sat on his folded long tail. He was sitting in a mediation position while stretching his arms behind his back lazily. As for his speed? He was going only slightly slower than before due to him surfing on dunes instead of flying over them like the other two. This is so unfair. Valkyrie cried in her mind at the demoralizing sight of Felix catching up to them without wasting a single ounce of energy. She knew that he was probably relying on passive sand surfing since it was a somewhat known ability, unlike the other unique ones. Although the distance was getting a bit longer between them, she understood that she was bound to get exhausted in the middle of the desert if she kept going at this pace. When that happens, forget about the marathon, they would either get killed by Felix or the beasts hiding under the sand. Dream's Nocturne was no different. Felix was killing them slowly but surely. It seems like Dream's Nocturne and Valkyrie are at their wit's end. Dallas sighed. They are hopeless to reach the finish line and they can't even kill Landlord since their energy is too low. Even if it wasn't, I doubt they were capable of killing him. The only chance they got to win the game is by Landlord ending up dying to the beasts lurking underneath the desert. The viewers agreed with his comment as they also believed that Felix had pretty much secured the win unless he got super unlucky with the desert's obstacles. Unbeknownst to them, Felix was able to feel the vibrations in the sand making him sense the beast's positions from kilometers under the sand. Even if he didn't have it, he could easily utilize his vision abilities to spot them beforehand. Hence, the moment he noticed that a two-meter scorpion-like beast was about to emerge tens of meters in front of him, he changed his direction slightly to the left. Splush! As expected, a brownish-scaled scorpion had emerged right next to Felix instead from beneath him. Before the viewers could exclaim at its sudden appearance, the scorpion straightaway attacked Felix with its gleaming red sting. Whoosh! Alas, the golden sand rose in front of the sting and blocked it automatically without Felix even glancing at it. Looking at the frozen stiffly scorpion, Asna couldn't help but feel bad for it. Why are you bullying the little thing like this? You want him to hit me? Felix asked speechlessly. I see no issues with that. Asna laughed. Too bad, in this desert even if I wanted to let them hit me, they wouldn't be able to. Felix said while glancing at the poor scorpion who was chasing after him. If this wasn't a race, he would have started farming the beasts here. While Felix was being chased by a couple of new desert beasts that failed to kill him, Dreams Nocturne and Valkyrie weren't having the best time either. Giant page-colored worms kept emerging from the dunes and reach up to those two who were ten meters in the air. Felix wasn't exposed to the same worms since he was racing on the ground obediently. Naturally, to balance things out, the game made it harder for those with flying abilities since it wouldn't make sense that only the players on the ground get exposed to the beasts. 
Those worms weren't easy to deal with as they were long and flexible, forcing those two to continue evading even when they pass over the worms. I can't do this anymore. Valkyrie said in dread, I am at 15% energy and I will drop to 10% soon if I kept dealing with those worms. Same. Dreams Nocturne frowned his eyebrows as he sent a message, I suggest we turn back to the grass field before the second obstacle begin and we get left stranded in the desert without energy to defend ourselves. My thoughts exactly. Valkyrie said. Sigh, it was a close game. Dreams Nocturne glanced at Felix and complained, mythical bloodliners are truly too unfair to play against. The moment he noticed that Valkyrie had made a sharp turn, Dreams Nocturne stopped thinking about those disheartening matters and followed after her. Their lives were far more important than forcefully trying to secure a win with all of those disadvantages stacked against them. I guess their energy tank had finally given up on them. Felix smirked as he gazed at them flying towards the grass field but not from his direction. They weren't stupid to come near Felix since he could simply fly up and force them to fight him. While they didn't know how much energy he had, they understood that it was much more than theirs. As expected, Valkyrie and Nocturne were forced to make a tactical retreat. Dallas leaned against his chair and shook his head slightly, you can't just sprint in a marathon from the very start and expect to finish it. While those two Idols fans were sighing in dejection or booing for Felix, Emma and the rest of the club had already started an early celebration by chanting loudly. Five wins in row five more to go. Five. Wins in row five more to go. Five. Wins in row five more to go. It seems like Landlord's fans are believing in their idols' chances to break the current win streak record in the SG Human branch. Dallas commentated while switching the camera to Emma, Marcus, and the rest. It was common knowledge that the highest win streak record was 10 wins. It was currently held by a retired SG player who became a bloodline clan leader in the Bardo Empire. However, unlike Felix, he didn't skip to gold from silver and he also didn't win the first four placement games, making him obtain a single-tier advancement in each win and also have a shitty MMR. That made it easier for him to win four games in bronze and four more in silver just to end his winning streak after winning two more gold games. But still, to achieve so, he was extremely strong and skilled. But most importantly, he had a stroke of defying luck to get games that he was good at and advantageous to his abilities. Meanwhile, Felix could care less about the record as he was playing to climb as fast as possible. Another win in the bag. I wonder how much revenue would I be getting for this one. Felix pondered while scratching his chin. Felix believed that he should be getting at least 40 billion SC since the expensive ticket prices alone were going to net him 30 billion SC. Don't even mention the stream, the recorded game earnings, etc. If it wasn't for the SG Alliance deducting 5% taxes from his total, he would have earned more. Thankfully, the SG Alliance gave him straight away the deducted amount to not piss him off after seeing how much he was getting robbed. 40 billion SC Felix thought, I should donate 1 billion SC to the planet's bank account for the troubles I brought to the citizen. It truly won't be fun for them to know that most backgrounds are sending their people over. But, if everything went well with the Anti-Royalty Alliance, they wouldn't need to worry at all. Felix still felt responsible for the plight he caused by his exposure. Though it was going to happen sooner or later. Honestly, he felt that it was much better that it happened now instead of later since the planet was still locked from outsiders. If he got exposed months or years later, the planet would have already integrated with other kingdoms, giving their bloodliners permission to roam the planet freely. By then, the citizen would truly get harassed by those bloodliners due to Felix. But now, as long as the council never gives permission to anyone, those citizens wouldn't be approached by the non-natives. However, those backgrounds could still potentially hire natives and make them do their bids like the Gama organization. Nevertheless, Felix wasn't worried about this as well since the second planetary game was just around the corner and when he wins it, they would order for a planetary defensive grid that helps them strike down space.i.p.s that either land on their soil or in space. If those background fleets got destroyed or kicked out from the planet, 
those earthling gangs and criminal organizations wouldn't dare to provoke the council after they see their means. Surveillance tower and planetary defensive grid were the backbones of every planet in this era. Only by having both of them could primitive planets afford to focus on their citizen without worrying too much about non-natives. That's why he wasn't worried about his grandfather and Olivia getting kidnapped. As long as his grandfather and family remained in Pearl Island, they would be safe from criminals, aiming for them. Even if someone made it to the island, Eric and Malik were going to wipe the floor with them. As for Olivia, she was staying in the Earthling headquarter, the safest place on the entire planet. Whoosh whoosh. Felix's thoughts were broken by the sound of the wind that had noticeably increased in speed. Sand grains were lifted in the air and drifted by, making Felix rest his chin on his hand, it seems like the sandstorm is approaching. Not a second later, Felix managed to spot a massive brownish cloud that was edging closer to him from the front. It was long enough, it stretched past Felix's line of sight. In terms of size, Felix didn't know how big it was but he believed that it was even bigger than the tsunami. Yet, not a shred of fear had resurfaced on Felix's face as he kept surfing on his tail. This game might not be over after all. Dallas said, if by some miracle, Landlord ended up dying in the sandstorm, the players behind him who had yet to surrender, could still win it. Alas, Dallas regretted those words the moment Felix had entered the sandstorm. Felix's body didn't even get hit by a single sand grain as the moment they reach one meter to him, they freeze like he had some sort of a godly aura blocking them off. But in reality, those sand grains were simply reacting to Felix's passive absolute sand defense. How could sand harm Felix when he has this passive? Hence, the creation of a mind-blowing scene of Felix surfing in the middle of a raging sandstorm without having a speck of dirt on his face or clothes. He truly became a semi-god in the desert with his abilities. Dallas commentated with a wry smile. Making the viewers envy Felix for his sand bloodline that caused all of this. When Dallas saw that Felix had passed through the sandstorm successfully, he murmured near his mic, maybe he will reach beyond the four greats in the Universal Individual Supremacy Games. Chapter 436, The Largest Sum He Had Ever Won the moment his voice resounded in the stadium and the stream, most viewers shuddered in shock and alarm. The same thought couldn't help but go through their minds. When they recalled Felix's abilities, experience, skills and other assets that separate him from the rest of the players, they started to see that he might actually be able to pull it off. It's been really a long long time since we had a bloodliner climb to diamond rank of the UISG. Maganda Chief sighed. Indeed. The only four bloodliners who made it to that rank are being named the Great Four. Zazia shook her head, but in reality, there is nothing great in having only four humans from a quadrillion population in the galaxy make it to diamond rank. Well, it's really not easy to climb the UISG where it was infested with hundreds of different races that were built for combat from their birth unlike us. Gabrielle said, it is already a legendary achievement in my eyes to go beyond platinum rank in that hellish competition. Do you think Landlord could actually go beyond them? Maganda wondered. I don't know. Zazia said, we don't even know if he was going to accept the normal promotion and stay in the SG human branch or break off and join the UISG. I believe in the latter. Maganda nodded his head firmly. If his organization truly wanted to gather data about the strength of the bloodline then testing it against other races is the best course possible. Clearly, Landlord is overpowering bloodliners easily and he shouldn't be even in gold rank. True, he is too strong and the organization wouldn't be getting useful data against those bloodliners. Barry agreed. This meant, he only needs to win one more game against Bloodliners before playing the promotion games in the UISG platform. Maganda smiled faintly, I won't lie and say that I am quite anticipated to see the reaction of other races when they fight against him. Ha ha ha, same, same. Our race has been bullied more than enough in UISG gold and platinum rank. Gabrielle smirked, it's time for our turn. Though his integration is too low currently. Zazia chimed in, 
he needs to integrate in the next months to a year until he reaches peak third stage of replacement. I believe he would have enough strength to place his mark in gold rank by then unlike the rest of the bloodliners who get trampled on like children. The rest of the alliance agreed with her. That's if he isn't caught by then. Barry added one last time before focusing back on Felix who was just about to reach the finish beacon without any dramatic occurrence. He just crossed over it and when he emerged on the other side, the beacon had exploded into bright lights, leaving behind a single notice for the incoming players. Congratulations to the champion landlord for finishing the marathon first. Immediately after the players saw it, they smiled bitterly while slowing their speed down until they stopped at once. Meanwhile, those chilling in the grass merely dusted their hands and stood up, preparing for the teleportation. Although battles were allowed in the grass field, no one bothered to provoke another without benefits that were worth risking for. Hence, this marathon might have apocalyptic natural disasters, but not a lot of players ended up dead in the game. Now that you are done, get some rest, and continue your training. The J. Ramongindra said after he saw that Felix was in the process of teleportation. Felix's joy from winning the game was replaced with dread after remembering the grind that was waiting for him. I will be on it after a nap. He said after opening his eyes back in the rumbling stadium that was filled with booze and cheers, but mostly booze. You have two hours break. The J. Ramongindra informed calmly, there is much to learn and time isn't our ally in your situation. Felix nodded his head slightly while waving his hand to his fans and the angry mob that was booing him. He understood that even if he trained his poison manipulation for a year, it was nothing compared to serpent halflings who were training with their limited manipulation since the moment they were born. Naturally, those were the remaining descendants of the J, Ramungandra and God knows how they would react to him when he meets with them in the UISG. After all, he was af asterisking human with poison manipulation just like them, no, he had the complete version unlike them. Still, at this moment, they were a hundred times better than him in manipulating poison. He had to work hard every day to bridge the gap lest he ends up shaming the J, Ramungandra in front of other primogenitors when they see that the champion he chose was worse than his descendants. Two hours of nap, better get going. Felix smiled one last time to the spectators before flashing away, leaving behind him disgruntled Dallas, who was just about to jump down for a quick post-game interview with him. Too bad, Felix wouldn't be the same without leaving unanswered questions behind him. One hour and a half later, in the Androxa house. The game's highlights were already spread all over the network in the galaxy for those interested in SG News. The moment Felix had won the game, he received another bunch of invitations to interviews, threats, insults, troll emails, etc., making Emma drawn in them. Though, she clearly filtered only the useful ones and left the rest in the spam. Since Felix had fully blocked communication with George, Olivia, Johnson, Mr. Rodriguez, and the rest of the people close to him, he ended up receiving congratulations emails from them. To which he read them after waking up from his nap. Felix chuckled when he read that Olivia was threatening to cut all relations with him if he didn't unblock her. Too bad, Felix had no intentions of unblocking them for now as he had no time to deal with their questions and inquires. He understood that they were eager just like the rest to know his secrets and possibly benefit from them as well. That was completely understandable behavior but Felix didn't have time for it. When he dealt with their emails, Felix jumped to Chief Maganda's email that was sent in the past hour after they failed to get in touch with him. A minute later, Felix closed the email while rubbing his chin, it seems like they are getting a bit impatient with meeting the organization. I guess it's time to put them at ease that the organization is the real deal. I can't lose allies like them and especially when I can take full advantage of their resources. After making his decision, Felix sent a small message to Chief Maganda entailing that he got a video meeting with them at 12 a.m., next Friday, so, in seven days. Upon doing so, Felix waved the inbox from his face and requested, Queen, please show me the game's earnings again, I want to do a quick calculation. When Felix had just teleported to his house, 
The first thing he did was glance at his earnings, but since he only had two hours of rest, he left it after he wakes up from his nap. Slash slash. Winning wish. Total streaming revenue, 0.01% from game points slash 1% from popularity slash 3% from victory 47.5 billion SC, with taxes. Game points collected solo, 600 GP slash slash. Although the earning list wasn't as long as the previous ones, it was still the best earning list Felix had ever gotten. 47.5 billion SC. That's after the Alliance took their taxes. Felix couldn't help but smile foolishly after seeing the amount again. He understood that with the 11 billion SC that he possessed right now, he would have 58.5 billion SC in his bank account. That's liquid assets that could be used any time and any day. But, Felix understood that this was merely a one-time occurrence due to the viewers fighting for tickets to see the appearance and abilities of first mythical bloodliner. However, in the upcoming games, the ticket prices would return to somewhat normal as well as the streaming viewership. 98% of people would rather watch the highlights in the VR videos platform for free than watch an entire game. Hehe, <laughs> even if the amount would be lowered in the next game, it would definitely not get lower than 15 billion SC in each game. Felix rubbed his hands together like a sleazy salesman, making Lady Sphinx roll her eyes at his poorness. In her eyes, coins wouldn't even get her the cheapest material in her current state. Thankfully, she kept those thoughts to herself. Queen show me my profile. Felix requested. Name of the participant, unpaid landlord underscore 6996. Age. Address. Integration level. Rank, high tier gold, placements are finished. Games played, 005. Wins, 005. Loss, 000. Win streak, 005. Click to obtain rewards. Loss streak, 000. Eliminations, 047 slash slash. Hopefully, I have gotten some good coupons this time. Felix rubbed his palms in anticipation and pressed on the win streak button. Immediately after a hologram emerged before him. Slash slash one, one tier advancement coupon, allow the user to jump a tier in any rank. You can't skip promotion games. One use slash 365 days before expiring. Two, x2 game points coupon, allow the user to double all earned game points in one game. Only game points farmed in the game are counted, one use slash 365 days before expiring. Three, world announcement coupon. Allow the user to send a message into the sky, visible throughout the entire game world. 1 use slash 365 days before expiring. 4. Format pick coupon, allow the user to pick a format of his own choice. 1 use slash 365 days before expiring, slash slash. Not bad, not bad at all. Felix grinned. All of those coupons were useful in their own moments. Especially, the X2 Game Points coupon. If he had it in his previous games, he would have earned at least 2-0k GP. Meanwhile, the one-tier advancement coupon was almost perfect for Felix in this situation as he could skip straight to the promotion game, but, he wasn't going to do it. He wasn't a retard to let go of a chance to brutalize those peak second stage bloodliners one last time and earn tens of billions SC of their backs. Plus he would be able to continue his winning streak, giving him more coupons. He he he, I will activate the format pick coupon and choose the battle format in my next game. Felix licked his lips, let's see how many game points I will earn from hunting them. Chapter 437, Methods to Enter the UVR Kind of feel bad that I missed the PPFT market gathering. Seeing the pitiful GP amount in the list made Felix remember the PPFT market that was going to be held in seven days. Although it was seven days later, Felix still had missed it since by the time the players gather in the market, his prize pool items would have already been purchased by other players in his game. Honestly, 
it was for the best that Felix didn't go since he was probably going to be harassed by the players when he places his shop. Those players would not buy shit from him and also annoy the rest of the players who actually wanted to buy something. To avoid all of that, it was much better to just not participate in this one. At least until the situation about his bloodlines cool down. Upon seeing that the two hours of rest were about to finish, Felix quickly contacted Goatee. Ring ring, clunk. After the call got connected, Felix requested the entire epic tier 5 stock of bird species from fire and wind element. Before Godi could register his request, Felix added, I also want the entire stock of octopus species with water element and avian species. Are you sure about it? Godi gulped a mouthful and said, that would be a total of 26 bottles. Just give me their pricing. Felix rushed him. Give me a moment. Godi went silent for a couple of seconds before sending Felix an email that had each bloodline price and the total amount if he bought them all. 9.9 .9 billion SC for 7 fire bottles, 8 wind bottles, 8 water bottles, and lastly 3 avion species bottles. Those water bottles were for the trade he was planning on making with the Anti-Royalty Alliance. He was going to sell them a 75% essence primogenitor bottle. In return, he was going to make them sign a contract that was extremely beneficial to him. Felix didn't doubt that they wouldn't accept it since they were desperate to get their hands on a primogenitor's bottle. Too bad, 75% wasn't enough to awake the primogenitor and their tech wasn't going to discover the secrets of the essence since only beings like primogenitors and unigens could do so. Hehe, <laughs> I should milk them out of 50 billion SC for it. Felix grinned widely while disconnecting the call. If others knew that Felix was going to earn 50 billion SC for a bottle that cost him almost nothing with his reselling scheme, they would honestly cough out blood from envy. Though, Felix understood that the reason the first bottle was expensive as hell was due to its research value. When the Anti-Royalty Alliance find out nothing from researching the bottle, they weren't going to buy it again at the same price like fools. Felix merely cared about the one bottle going to the light so he could remove the suspension on him as everyone would be aiming their guns at his organization. Plus, he wouldn't receive more public backlash when the news of the bottle's existence spread far and wide. The only problem with this plan is my location. Felix thought, Badadai can't deliver cross galaxies and I don't trust anyone with my coordinates. This was the reason Felix purchased those 26 bottles now. He was planning on waiting thousands of kilometers near the VIP wormhole expressway for Badadai to bring him his stuff. Because the moment he enters the wormhole and emerges from the other side, he wouldn't stop until the next Mariana's VIP expressway. That expressway would be connected to the Witch for Scythia Galaxy's outskirts. Felix wanted to make two last deliveries with Badadai before he exits the galaxy. He wasn't worried about getting located by other spaceship.i.p.s due to his spaceship's excellent anti-surveillance system. Plus, he would be staying tens of thousands of kilometers away from the wormhole, it was almost impossible to spot him like that. Phew, too many things to do and consider. Felix glanced at his bracelet and cracked his neck, but nothing will matter if I don't increase my strength first. Let's start training. The J. Ramongandra smiled faintly when he saw that he had started practicing the liquefying technique. Checkmate. Lady Sphinx drunk a sip while gesturing with her head at the chessboard. The J, Ramongandra's smile stiffened after hearing so. He looked at his chessboard and started to feel despair playing against this monster. They were already on their 40 games and he had yet to win a single game, making Asna mock him every single day for it. Let's postpone for later. The J, Ramongandra coughed, it seems like the kid is requiring my guidance. Looking at Felix who was training in silence, Lady Sphinx snickered lightly at his attempt to weasel away. But she didn't embarrass him by exposing it. Instead, she teleported to Asna's mansion, where Asna was currently watching a rerun of the same series in boredom. What are you watching? Lady Sphinx asked while sitting at the side of the bed. My boyfriend can't understand me, a long drama with three seasons. Asna said lazily. 
I don't know why you guys like watching people acting fakely. Lady Sphinx shook her head. It's not like I have anything else to do. Asna murmured. Why don't you enter the UVR then? Lady Sphinx frowned her eyebrows, I believe that it is possible to connect to the UVR if you possess this thief's body for a couple of seconds until the Queen AI binds your consciousness with the AP bracelet. No. Asna shook her head firmly, at the start, I was trying to hiddenly possess his body by using the purified energy without caring if it was going to work or not. But now, I don't dare to risk it since it might fail and his brain could end up imploding if I switched with him. Indeed. Lady Sphinx agreed with her on this point. She was already informed by Asna about her prisoning situation and the millions of souls that she absorbed their memories. Those memories were going to be daunting to handle for Felix's brain if Asna attempted to possess his body even for a few seconds. Although she believed that there was like a 10% chance of that happening, she still didn't want to tell Felix about it and put him in a bad position. Well, if you promise me something, I can help you out. Lady Sphinx tempted, I know a potion recipe that allows the soul to be split into two halves for a couple of seconds. Asna raised her eyebrows in surprise and said, A potion like that exists? I thought only the spirits and souls Unigen Guardian is capable of doing that. Well, my limit is just for three seconds. Souls and spirits are too hard for me to study since the spiritual universe is blocking my access. Lady Sphinx informed, but I can tweak the recipe to make it target splitting both of your souls from each other for four seconds and that would give you enough time for the queen to bind your consciousness with the bracelet. Is it going to harm Felix? Asna asked with a worried tone. Don't worry your boyfriend will only feel some pain from the process. Lady Sphinx teased after seeing that Asna truly cared for Felix's well-being. Boyfriend. Asna humphed like hell I will ever end up together with that pervy prick. Haha, <laughs> aren't you guys together right now? Lady Sphinx laughed while covering her mouth, making Asna feel annoyed. Seeing that she wasn't going to reply, Lady Sphinx chuckled, Fine, fine, just tell me do you want to make a deal or not? What do I need to offer? Asna tilted her head in confusion and asked, I doubt I have something that's useful to you. Lady Sphinx got closer to Asna and requested with a smile, I simply want you to help me out in the latest discovery of mine when you finally split your soul from this little thief. By then, your peak strength would have been recovered. Are you willing to wait that long? Asna said, I doubt I will be freed any time soon. Don't worry. Lady Sphinx offered her furry golden hand to Asna and winked, the only thing I don't lack is time. Upon hearing so, Asna shook her hand to seal the deal and said eagerly, When are you going to finish the potion? My clone was already in the process of tweaking the recipe a week ago. Lady Sphinx smiled, I don't know when she will finish the whole thing but it wouldn't take more than a year. It seemed like Lady Sphinx had expected Asna to agree to the deal before she even proposed it. A year. Asna nodded her head, That's not too long. All right, I will leave you be. Seeing that she didn't mind, Lady Sphinx stood up. However, before she could teleport, Asna asked her suddenly, How about that old snake? Do you have a way for him to enter the UVR? What are you talking about? Lady Sphinx looked at her speechlessly, Unlike you, he can enter the UVR anytime he wanted. He is a separated consciousness and he only needs a bracelet and call for the Queen. The hell? Was it always that simple? Asna was left at loose for words at the sound of that. Of course, your problem is that the Queen AI considers you and Felix as one person due to your soul being merged. That's why splitting your souls would do the trick. But for J, RMI? He doesn't need to do any of that. Lady Sphinx clarified. Old Snake did you hear that? Asna shouted from the window at the J. Ramongandra who was sitting on a tea table while watching Felix train. Yes. He shouted back without turning his head. Then why don't you enter the UVR? Didn't I tell you many times that I don't want to? The J, Ramongandra said. Upon hearing so, 
Asna realized the reason why neither she nor Felix knew that it was so easy for J. Ramungandra to get access to the UVR. The old snake never gave them the chance to even try since he always expressed his disinterest to enter the UVR. J. RMI stop being stubborn. Lady Sphinx teleported next to him and said, How are you going to meet with other primogenitors and bet with them if you keep staying here? True. The J. Ramungandra glanced at Asna and asked telepathically, Did you find a way to help her enter the UVR as well? I did. Lady Sphinx's eyes widened slightly as she asked telepathically, Don't tell me you never bothered with the UVR due to her. The J. Ramungandra smiled gently while looking at the fuming Asna who seemed furious on his place for rejecting to enter the UVR. I just didn't want her to feel left behind. The J. Ramungandra focused back on Felix and said lastly, She suffered in the past and is suffering in the present. Sigh, when she gets freed, she will suffer again in the future. Understanding what he was implying, Lady Sphinx took a glance at Asna and thought, The origin of laws, a being that shouldn't have been born. She shook her head to remove those thoughts and said, Don't worry about her, she will join next year in the UVR if everything went well. All right. I will inform the lad after he finishes his training. The J. Ramungandra waved his hand at Lady Sphinx and shouted at Felix after seeing him entering a daze. Don't lose focus. Chapter 438, Deciding the Newest Element After training his poison manipulation for over eight hours, Felix finally decided to stop for the day as he was mentally exhausted. Since the results weren't really that obvious, the training truly appeared like a rewardless daily grind. But, Felix had no intentions of bailing out on reaching second stage of poison manipulation as fast as possible. When Felix went for a quick shower, the J. Ramungandra had informed him about his desire to enter the UVR and the way to do so. Naturally, the first thing Felix asked was Asna's chances of using the same method. Although he was told that wasn't possible, Lady Sphinx did inform him about the potion that she was making for Asna. Are you willing to drink it? Lady Sphinx asked, Your life wouldn't be endangered but the pain both of you will experience would be beyond your comprehension. Isn't just pain. Felix chuckled, I am used it to by now. Let's see if you will say the same when you taste pain based on soul. Lady Sphinx kept this thought to herself. She didn't want to discourage him or make him stressful when the potion wouldn't be ready until a year later. Elder, I will shop for an 11th generation or hopefully 12th generation bracelet right now. Felix informed the J. Ramungandra, I only have normal bracelets on me now and they lack too many useful features. All right, you know better. The J. Ramungandra said, smiling. Felix nodded his head while opening a website that belonged to the metal race branch in the galaxy. This website was responsible for selling all the technologies, equipment, gadgets, devices, bracelets, and every other invention by the metal race. Naturally, Felix didn't have access to everything but just the public items. He straightaway entered the bracelets section and scrolled to the most expensive ones that were still available in stock. Upon finding that 150 11th Gen AP bracelets were still in stock, he quickly purchased two online and obtained their serial codes. Then, he sent it to Badadai and told him to bring them with the rest of the 26 bottles. Two days later, at 11.05 am. Sir Felix, the spaceship has stopped exactly 10,480 km away from the VIP Wormhole Expressway. The Queen's monotonous voice resounded in Felix's mind, interrupting his training session. Felix threw a poisonous liquid drop in his mouth and requested calmly, Log me out. The moment Felix opened his eyes in VR pod, the needles that were connecting to his bloodstream, automatically withdrawn while the glass door opened up slowly. Felix stepped outside of the pod wearing only his underwear. His feet were touching the room's carpet naturally like gravity was still applied on the spaceship. That's because of the artificial gravity of the spaceship. Felix didn't bother to look through the science of it but he knows that the centripetal force wasn't required in the technology used. Anyhow, Felix stretched his limbs for a couple of seconds before walking to the closest window to him. 
Since the spaceship was finally not moving and there was no close star to emit light, Felix was left to marvel at the universe's breathtaking beauty. Stars of different colors, appearing like tiny dots, colorful nebulas of different shapes and sizes filled Felix's vision, making him wonder about their astronomical size. Although he had been to space many times and experienced its beauty on multiple occasions in his clan's space sh.i.p.s, Felix always got mesmerized by it. Waking up to such a sight is truly a delightful experience. Feeling refreshed, Felix smiled and walked to the spaceship's cafeteria. When he was seated on a circular milky white table, he pressed on the holographic menu and ordered breakfast. He wasn't worried about the food or taste being horrible since the kitchen was run by bots and the food stock in the spaceship was loaded to the brim. The stock would probably last him a couple of years. Naturally, Felix had ordered for his spaceship to be filled with all of this before it reached him. In a short while, Felix started eating his breakfast while sending the newest coordinates to Bodadai. Since he was in space, the coordinates were different as there was no altitude, latitude, or four directions. Instead, it was a long serial code of 1000 letters mixed with numbers. This code wouldn't make sense to anyone but the Queen AI. That's because the UVR's roots were spread on a universal level. That made it possible to map out at least 30% of the known universe and make the queen be the GPS of everyone. Hence, when Felix sent this code to Bodadai, the queen would inform Bodadai of the exact place where Felix was currently standing. Naturally, this wouldn't have worked if Felix's spaceship was in an area that wasn't mapped out. The way to map out an area was simple. The AP bracelet of every person was constantly scanning the area around him. For example, Felix's 11th gen bracelet was capable of scanning up to a 1 km radius. This meant right now, he was helping the Queen map out that 1 km around him. Though, in this situation, the Queen already possessed a map of his area since other people had gone through here for billions of times due to being in one of the directions to the Wormhole Expressway. The reason people allow this to happen was because it was to their own benefit. Without the Queen's map and GPS feature, they wouldn't know where to go and how to arrive at another place fast enough without ending up crashing into a meteor, planet, or another unlucky spaceship in their path. Only due to the Queen AI was it possible to fly at the speed of light without that kind of worry. That's because she always chooses the perfect path to their destination. If she couldn't do so, she would inform them to see if they were willing to risk going blindly or not. This was another reason why the Queen was treated in high regard by everyone. When Felix had finished dealing with Bodadai's situation, he went to the C.O.C.K pit, wanting to see the VIP Wormhole Expressway. Alas, his spaceship was parked way too far for him to spot it. Adding to the stars and nebulas around him made it impossible to know which dot it belongs to it. Felix understood that if this was a natural wormhole, its size would be noticeable even if he was hundreds of thousands of kilometers away. Too bad, Felix knew that the space worm race wasn't capable of creating wormholes with that astronomical size. Only the universe was capable of creating them. The space primogenitor is capable of creating it. The J, Ramongandra interrupted, I have seen him once do it. Heck. I believe that wormhole is still up and running to this day if that fatty worm is still alive. He is alive all right. Lady Sphinx said, he was also part of the primogenitors who decided to enter the illusionary world. Upon hearing so, Felix clutched his heart in pain as he knew that his chance to use the space element had been forever butchered. A live primogenitor equals bad choice. If Lady Sphinx wasn't kind and had probably a thing for the J, Ramongandr, he assumes, she wouldn't have spared him even if she saw his research value. Felix had no intentions of testing his luck for the third time with another alive primogenitor. I heard you order Avian species bottles before, have you finally made up your mind? Lady Sphinx asked. Yes, there is no point in delaying it any further. Felix nodded his head. Naturally, to make sure that Felix ends up with a primogenitor that was willing to hand him his elemental manipulation, they discussed it days ago. After all, 
Lady Sphinx was going to make experiments on Felix to turn him into the first person to host multiple elemental manipulations in the universe. That wouldn't be possible if the primogenitors chosen refused to give their elemental manipulations. That's why the primogenitors who were still alive were the first to be eliminated. Followed by primogenitors who were dead but had hostile or unfriendly relations with J, Ramungandra and the Sphinx. Even ones who disliked lesser races were removed as well since they might straightaway kill Felix from disgust. Heck, even the illusion primogenitor was eliminated since he was still alive like Lady Sphinx. This made Felix drop any thoughts of utilizing the illusion affinity that he had. It was a hard decision but it had to be done to avoid getting killed. In the end, Felix was left with merely seven potential primogenitors who were dead and also had a familiar relation with either the J, Ramungandra or Lady Sphinx. Those primogenitors were representing seven elements, ranging from common, uncommon to rare. But Lady Sphinx told Felix to focus only on common elements first since she explained that uncommon and rare elements were more complex and it would make her research tougher from the start. It was better to start simple and increase the difficulty as they go. Felix had no issue with that. He already dropped his prejudice against common elements. The three common elements he was given to choose from were, lightning, wind, and water. The lightning element was belonging to Thor. The wind element was for the celestial rock. Lastly, the water element as belonging to the kraken. Just because wind and water were going to be used by Eric and the Anti-Royalty Alliance, it didn't mean that Felix couldn't use them as well. After all, 99% of the essence that he gathers from bloodlines wasn't the only amount out there. In fact, if Felix wanted, he could continue gathering the J, Ramungandra's essence from other tiers 5-6-7 bloodlines and create more 99% filled bottles. But he didn't do so since he never had to and his capital never allowed him to go for side projects like those. With that being said, Felix had still made his choice in the past couple of days after thinking deeply about it. The lightning element is my final pick. He informed calmly, I will be awakening Thor, the elder's best friend, and rival. Good choice. Lady Sphinx smiled, he is the one with the highest chances of giving you his elemental manipulation. Felix nodded his head in agreement. But he didn't only do it for that but also because the lightning element was the perfect one for him currently. After all, the lightning element was one of the best for destructiveness and also mobility. Felix was missing both. The only reason Felix was hesitating to pick the lighting element instantly was due to Thor's unique species. The J, Ramungandra had shown him how Thor appeared in his species when he was given the choices. He belonged to the Avyan species, an ancient and extremely rare creature that lived in planets with thunderclouds raging all year long. This species was known for their ill-like resemblance as they were long, thin, and had fish-like scales with tiny holes in them. Meanwhile, their scales color ranges from black and white. While eels were known for living in shallow water, the Avions lived in thunderclouds by consuming clouds and lightning. While clouds were their source of food, Lightning was their source of survival. Without absorbing it ceaselessly day and night, their speed wouldn't be fast enough that gravity wouldn't work on them. Because they never stop wheezing by inside the thunderclouds, it was extremely difficult to catch them and extract their bloodline essence. Hence, their prices weren't a joke. But with Felix's win in the fifth game and the upcoming load of coins from selling the water bottle to the Anti-Royalty Alliance, Felix stopped bothering with prices and just went for the pick. Cough, Elder you told me to pick an element but how am I supposed to land on it when I drink the elemental potion? Felix asked with a tingle of hope, or are you going to gift me a potion that could help me awaken lightning element? Naturally, I can easily make a potion that could achieve such a result. Lady Sphinx said. Before Felix could get CK to hear this, Lady Sphinx said calmly, but I don't gift stuff. I make trades and deals, always. Chapter 439, Being Given a Dreadful Mission Deals Felix asked speechlessly. Yes, the potion is worth 45 billion SC. Lady Sphinx said, only I and Sage Witches can concoct it. 
Felix drew a deep breath at the price. He expected that it would expensive since he never heard of a potion that could specifically awaken a targeted element but he didn't know it would be this much. 45 billion SC is the market price for it but it goes for way higher than that. Lady Sphinx said calmly, this potion rarely gets sold but traded with an item of an equal value. That's because it doesn't just awaken the lightning element but also increase your affinity of it by 30% at once. No wonder! Felix exclaimed. He understood that if the potion truly provided 30% affinity enhancement then its price was fully justifiable. Although in his case that 30% was useless since he had a snap but for other users, they would need to spend at least need 30 billion SC for it. It wasn't easy at all to increase affinity and people would jump on any item that was helping them increase it no matter how expensive it was. This wasn't just for humans but for other races that were heavily reliant on elemental affinity as well. So, am I going to pay 45 billion for it? Felix clutched his heart at the thought of it. He just earned almost 50 billion from the game yet it was about to be spent almost entirely for a potion. Don't be silly. Lady Sphinx waved her hand and said calmly, I don't need coins, I have more than enough to create a planet of them. Tisk, tisk. Both Asna and the J, Ramungandra clicked their tongues after hearing her brag like this. Unbothered, Lady Sphinx said, what I want you to do is earn the potion. Felix sighed in relief and asked. Oh? What should I do? Not much. Lady Sphinx smiled faintly, I simply want you to emerge as one of the top three scorers in the first semester in the Royal Witch Academy. Wait what? Felix exclaimed in disbelief. This was honestly the last thing he expected to hear since it was totally random. He expected that he would be hired as a janitor for her lab, an errand boy or something like that to earn the potion. But top three scorers? Why was she interested in that? Upon seeing his puzzlement, Lady Sphinx said with a displeased tone, with each generation, those witches are getting worse and worse in their potion mastery. When I first decided to teach them, most witches were capable of easily reaching Grand Master rank and even Sage rank. But now? Lady Sphinx scoffed. The majority of them are stuck as Pody one or masters capable of concocting only rank 3 potions. Only an exceptional few were able to reach Grand Master. As for our Sage? There are barely 20 of them alive in the entire empire. This is an embarrassment to my teaching standards as I haven't introduced the art of potion making just to let them swim into the wealth those potions were bringing them. Felix might be a bit confused about some parts but he did understand other parts. Like the fact that rank 3 witches were one of the wealthiest people in the entire universe. That's because they were capable of concocting rank 3 potions like elemental potion with a 30% to 60% success rate. Rank 3 potions were best for the witches to earn money because they were expensive but also manageable to concoct, unlike rank 4 fifths potions. Those types of potions might be even more expensive but their materials were rare and most witches that were capable of concocting them had a 1% to 20% success rate. As for rank 1 half potions? They were the common ones like rejuvenation potions, pain relief potions, etc. They didn't have 3 billions and prices. Upon hearing Lady Sphinx's rant, Felix reasoned that witches seemed to pause their advancement to higher ranks after turning Master Pody 1 or due to the profits of rank 3 potions being the best. With that being said, Felix still failed to see what's his role in all of this. It's simple. Lady Sphinx said, if the newest generation of witches saw that a human is doing much better than them in the only thing they were truly good at, they would naturally work harder to prove themselves. Being in the top three of the first semester would suddenly change the entire situation. Felix was honestly at loss for words at her logic. Of course not. Lady Sphinx said nonchalantly, that's why you will keep being in the top three in the rest of the semesters until you graduate. When you graduate, I want you to be a master Pody Wonner, unlike the witches who could graduate only if they became expert Pody Wonners. Cough. I think I might want to pay for the potion with coins. Felix said with a tingle of fear in his tone. 
he should be afraid all right as Lady Sphinx was asking him to the do impossible while at the same time start a war against the witches in the academy. Felix doubted he could even become an expert potty winner in six semesters that span for three years even if he invested his entire time in potion making. If it was so easy, it wouldn't have been made into a graduation condition. Yet, Lady Sphinx was telling him to go beyond that and become a master potty winner? What a joke! Sphinx, you should go easy on him. The J, Ramungandra shook his head, he will be using most of his time training his poison manipulation, combat senses, techniques, playing the games, and more. If Thor was awakened and decided to give up on his lightning manipulation, he would need to focus on that as well for a bit. Adding potion making would merely make spread himself thin more than he already was. The J, Ramungandra said. Elder. Felix felt his eyes tear up a bit after receiving some support. Since he wasn't inside the consciousness space, he didn't know if Lady Sphinx approved or not. But a second later, she mentioned to the J, Ramungandra, don't worry, I will feed him some potions that are going to greatly enhance his performance permanently. Oh? Like what? Asna inquired for Felix. Photographic memory potion, neuron enhancement potion, veil of trance, and a couple more that could easily make him absorb knowledge and also smarter. Lady Sphinx smiled, with them, you would have an easier time studying and also concocting potions. Felix's eyes brightened up in delight after hearing so. He was always afraid of not having a talent for potion making. That worried him since if he didn't pick it up quickly, he would waste too much time on it. A well-needed time that could have been used efficiently for other matters. But with those potions, he would honestly be turned into a prodigy even if he was the dumbest person in the universe. He understood that some of those potions exist and were sold for billions of SC but their effects weren't permanent as Lady Sphinx claimed. Instead, their duration lasts from months to a year before wearing off and leaving the user to feel like a retard again. That makes them want to use those potions over and over like they were addicted to their effects. It was like taking that pill in the movie Limitless. Felix had just got offered to take a pill that had permanent effects. For that kind of potions, he didn't dare to imagine their prices since the potions had never landed in the market. But if he had to give them a price, he would guess that their total would be around 200 billion SC. But didn't you say that you don't gift stuff? Felix wondered after reeling in his excitement. Of course, those potions are your rewards for reaching the top three of each semester. Each potion is counted for a semester. Lady Sphinx warned with a pretty smile, so you better not disappoint me and get a lesser result. You won't like the outcome. Felix gulped a mouthful in dread after remembering that he was literally going to be experimented on like a lab rat. He was already in her hands and God knows what punishment she was going to give him if he failed his end of the bargain. I will try my best. He promised with a forced smile. You better. Lady Sphinx took a sip, I want to see those little witches doubt if you are a witch in disguise. Hee <laughs> hee, witch Felix. Asna giggled makes me laugh just thinking about it. Then don't think of it. Felix said in annoyance. He already expected that he would be getting a load of mockery after everyone starts addressing him, which Felix. He honestly dreaded the thought. I should probably create a male version which name to avoid having getting called a witch. Instead of fretting about it, Felix started brainstorming some ideas. He spent at least ten minutes eliminating a name after the other until he landed on one that pleased him. The Witcher. That has a nice ring to it. Felix grinned faintly, I don't mind being called that at all. Chapter 440, The Meeting Eye After waiting for three days somewhat near the wormhole without entering it, Badadai finally opened up a spatial bridge in the spaceship's cafeteria. Like nothing ever happened. Badadai simply threw the bottles and bracelets on the ground and went away just like always. Felix didn't react much to this since he had spoken on the phone with Badadai about the whole matter of him being landlord. Honestly, fatty Badadai didn't seem to give a shit about it since he wasn't a human. Only humans cared about Felix's ability to own many abilities. The rest of the races? 
It either appeared like a joke to races with limited manipulation or a farce to races who never bother with strength and fighting. Since Felix and Badadai had a strict lifelong contract that could be signed with only one client, Badadai naturally wouldn't betray Felix and give away his coordinates since the penalty imposed was nothing like the one in regular contracts. Hence, as long as Felix was making deliveries with Badadai, he was in safe hands. Sadly, he only had one more chance to make another delivery before exiting the galaxy. Badadai was too young for cross galaxies deliveries. With that being said, Felix decided to think of a solution when he reached the Witch Empire. For now, he quickly wore the newest 11th generation bracelet and brought it to his eyes, Elder, try calling the Queen. The J, Ramungandra was already prepared for this. Hence, he closed his eyes and called Queen Ai in his mind. A few seconds later, the J, Ramungandra had opened his eyes in the same basic white room where the Queen Ai meet with everyone. Just like she did with Felix, she asked if the J, Ramungandra wanted to bind his consciousness with this bracelet. To which the J, Ramungandra agreed at once. The Queen congratulated him and asked if he wanted to know more about the UVR, Universe, AP bracelet, etc. But the J, Ramungandra had declined and requested with an intrigued expression, please take me to this link. He forwarded a long teleportation link like the ones Felix used to teleport to the yearly auction event. The Queen did as he asked and his body immediately started deconstructing into light particles. When he opened them up again, he was greeted by a cosmic golden pyramid that was suspended in space. Meanwhile, he was standing right in front of a wide opened up gate. Behind it, Lady Sphinx was waiting for him with a faint charming smile. Welcome to my UVR's territory J, RMI. Lady Sphinx said while extended her hand behind her. Thank you for your hospitality. The J, Ramungandra smiled faintly and entered the gate with her. The moment he stepped into the other side, the gate had closed up behind them. Elder, did it work? Felix asked after waiting for a minute without a response. He is in my place now. Lady Sphinx informed him. Phew, that's nice to hear. Felix sighed in relief while glancing at his second bracelet. Although it was attached to him, he realized that he couldn't even turn it on to look at the time. It was like the entire bracelet was dead. But in reality, the queen was considering the J, Ramungandra as the real owner and she wouldn't give access to Felix unless she was given permission by the owner. Elder Please tell him to make a bank account first so I can wire him a couple billion to work with. Felix requested while heading to the VR pod. Don't bother yourself with such matters. Lady Sphinx said, he is under my care now. Upon hearing so, Felix didn't bring the matter again since Lady Sphinx's care was a billion times better than him. You're next Isna. Felix joked, since the elder's bracelet had already taken my second wrist. I will place yours above my left ankle. My favorite place for my favorite girl. I dare you to do it uf asterisker. Asna snapped immediately at the sound of that. She couldn't imagine how humiliating that would appear but if Felix truly did it, she honestly would still not hesitate to enter the UVR. Beggars can't be chosers. Felix snickered while contacting the VIP wormhole expressway. Totally ignoring her second barrage of insults, he spoke politely to the company's employee for a few minutes. The content of their conversation was about his ID and spaceship license. When they got approved since he didn't have any criminal records, he was asked about the type of service he wanted. Whether he wanted to subscribe with the company or just pay for one-time entry. Naturally, Felix bought only one ticket for this wormhole to not leave any trails behind him since if he bought another one for the next wormhole that intel might end up in the hands of his hunters. They would know exactly where to wait for him. Even now, he wasn't completely safe. Hence, the moment he received the ticket after he paid 5 million SC for it, he requested the queen to enter the wormhole. Because it was a VIP expressway, the spaceship entered it with the speed of light not bothering with cues and checkups. That's why Felix entered the VR pod, he knew that he wasn't going to see the wormhole or experience how it was inside. 
but he didn't care about it since he had experienced it plenty of times in his previous life. If he had to describe being inside a wormhole, it would be quite difficult since he saw only a bunch of merged colors from the windows like he was inside a juice mixer. That's the closest thing he could come up with. Sir Felix, the spaceship has emerged from the other side of the wormhole. The Queen announced in his mind, you are currently near the center of the Mariana Empire. Should I stick to the preset path? Yes please. Felix agreed. He had no intentions of making a detour and going to check some of the popular hotspots in the Empire when everyone was on his ass. Hence, he entered another long journey to the next wormhole that would take at least 15 days. Four days later, at 12 p.m., Felix was sitting in his Androxa house's living room, wearing a suit and a disguise that changed his size, posture, face, voice, and everything else that could remotely associate with his real self. This was the disguise he was planning on using for the meeting with the Anti-Royalty Alliance. He had already created a fake name for himself, the organization, the people working there, etc. He wasn't planning on introducing them but it was better to be thorough in his lie. Let's begin. Felix took a deep breath to make himself focused and immediately sent his newest fake contact information to the Maganda chief with his real email. He simply informed him that one of the higher echelons of the organization was ready to meet him and he should contact him right now. After sending it, Felix waited for merely a minute before his bracelet started ringing. Here we go. Felix fixed his attire and accepted the call with an indifferent expression. Cluck. The moment the call was connected, five holographic videos emerged before Felix. Each one belonged to a member of the Anti-Royalty Alliance. Meanwhile, the image those five were seeing was a totally dark background and Felix wearing a black suit. Naturally, they didn't recognize him at all due to the disguise. You have two minutes. Felix said indifferently, not wanting to wait for Maganda Chief to make the mood friendly like he always does. His tone naturally displeased the seniors but they reeled it since they finally contacted the makers of the mythical bloodlines. Hence, they decided to respect those two minutes and straight away jump into the subject. There is no need to sugarcoat it. We are interested in your bloodlines and we want to enter a partnership that will ensure a steady stream of bottles for our people. Zazia said calmly. Felix didn't speak as he simply kept looking at them with a disinterested gaze making them frown their eyebrows slightly. Before they could start feeling irritated by his scornful look, they were shocked to hear him say calmly, here we are trying to create a path for the human race to surpass other races and remove this stigma of a weaker race from our name. Yet, you are desperate to get this power up for what? To win a war between you and the royal family. Maganda chief and the rest were left aghast at the sound of that without the ability to retort. Impossible. How does he knows about our alliance and plans to declare war against the royal family? Did one of your trusted subordinates leak the news? That's not possible for me. Zazia sent a message while trying her best to hide her agitation, all my loyal subordinates are hidden slaves. So, they can't betray me like this. Same. Me too. A heated discussion was ongoing telepathically between the five as the bombshell that Felix dropped was too much for them to handle. The information about their hidden alliance and the declaration of war were fully classified. Only a few trusted people knew it. They believed that it was possible for the organization to figure out about their alliance since they had met with Felix together during the auction, but the declaration of war was off bounds. You have one minute and thirty seconds. Felix said nonchalantly, making them break out of their discussion and focus on him. This time, they were looking at him with a hint of dread as they had no idea how much information did he know. Upon seeing the way he was treated, Felix smiled faintly and comforted, Don't worry, my organization never utilizes those kinds of information. We simply collect them for security reasons. Terrifying their roots must be buried deeply in most of the backgrounds if they could even know about our classified information. Gabrielle said telepathically. We will discuss this later, we need to convince them to sign a contract as fast as possible in this remaining minute. Zazia said, they are the real deal. 
Chapter 441, The Meeting 2 The rest nodded at once and the chief had taken the lead by mentioning, We have been informed of your grand goal and we will feel honored to be part of it. We can help your organization with many issues, protections, materials, resources, public relations. All of this would be done in the light. We truly feel that we can bring all of that to the table if we signed an alliance contract. Upon hearing so, Felix gazed at them without a single blink for ten seconds straight, making them feel slightly nervous that he would reject the offer. You want in return a stable stream of mythic bloodlines? Felix finally asked. The Alliance members glanced at each other and said at once, Yes. Forget it. Felix waved his hand dismissively at them. The moment they heard so, Maganda Chief immediately said, Wait, we are not in a rush to get bulks of them. You can take months to years until you fulfill your end of the bargain. Still a no. Felix asserted, The only thing we can do is make you the first party to get the first batches of bloodlines when we reach the manufacturing stage. We have no intentions of arming you for your conflict. We created those bloodlines to be spread far and wide, reaching the hands of most bloodliners. Seeing that they went quiet, probably not liking his bullshit offer, Felix pulled them slightly, we can sell you in a month or two the newest water-based mythical bloodline that we created. You can give it to your sons or daughters. Does it also have more abilities than six? Zazia asked swiftly. Yes. Mythical bloodlines provide nine abilities at 75% integration. Felix confessed. The Maganda chief and the rest drew a deep breath in agitation and excitement. They finally received a confirmation on the number and it was truly shocking. Three more abilities. This is big. No, it's four more. There is still peak active ability. We must get this bottle at all cost. My uncle had told me to not meet him without it. Zazia said. The old man told me the same. Maganda chief sighed. Their telepathic discussion ended just as it started. We are pleased by the gesture, but I have to ask. The Maganda chief, shouldn't we be getting two bottles to finish 99% to complete a stage? No. Felix said bluntly. You get one bottle since you are not the only one we are selling those bottles to and we don't have plenty around, yet. Maganda and the rest immediately got displeased at the sound of that. Who could blame them? Here they were doing their very best to become closer with the organization to secure this bloodline bottle and the upcoming ones, but Felix had just told them that everyone would be getting it. Upon seeing their clear displeasure, Felix waved his hand lightly and said, we are selling only three bottles in the next half a year to different backgrounds. You will be the first to get one, following by two more in the next months. Plus, we are not planning on selling the first batches to them but only you. Felix said calmly while manifesting a holographic hologram, that's of course if you agreed to the terms of this contract. The Anti-Royalty Alliance members all glanced at their email inbox after seeing that the same contract had been emailed to them. You have a week to make a decision. Felix closed the connection the moment he saw that all of them had started reading it. Phew. He let out a long sigh while leaning against his couch. It was quite stressful to keep a stern and solemn expression while he was spewing a fountain of bullshit. Well, not everything was a total lie since Felix truly was planning on taking half a year to sell three water-based bottles. That's because it wouldn't be easy to collect the essence for all of them and also deliver them back and forth when he was in a different galaxy. Plus, it would be tough to keep stabbing himself with hundreds of needles each day. Hence, he needed to be moderate if he was going to do it. This was also the reason he didn't want to agree to the Alliance's first term. He understood that the moment he signs that contract, he would be bound to fulfill his end of the bargain. There was no way he would be able to provide a stable stream of those bottles. But when he switched the term to receiving the first batch when they are done. That changed everything since he could drag this for tens of years and when he finally feels like getting it done, he could easily sell them ten bottles at once and he would be freed from the contract terms. By doing all of this, Felix would be legit receiving true allies that could help him and also protect planet Earth. 
though, it all depends on the anti-royalty alliance's desperation. Were they going to sign that shitty contract or not? Felix was 99% certain that they were going to sign it. Seven days later, Felix had received the alliance's answer. As he expected, they were desperate for the first bottle to sign the contract. That contract had many beneficial terms to him like the fact that Earth's protection would be taken seriously unlike before. Seriously in the sense that the three superpowers needed to sell fleets, train Earthling soldiers, sell used cheap AP bracelets, and more. With the resources in their possession, it wouldn't be long before the planet start to embrace new technologies faster than before. Another benefit was to give the organization a 30% discount off from all bloodline bottles and resources purchased in their kingdom's shops. Also, the customs taxes would be waived for the deliveries. With this, Felix finally wouldn't need to always buy from Godi's shop but expand to hundreds of shops at once with such a great deal. Felix knew that everything he bought would be supervised, especially the bottles. But he didn't really care since they would never be able to guess why he was buying them. The contract also entailed that the three superpowers would be required to speak goodwill about the organization and publish information given to them by it. Starting off by informing that the organization was the one creating bloodlines and they were working hard to manufacture them for public use. Also, the organization was open to selling nine bottles separately in the next half year in an auction hosted by the three superpowers. Felix planned on using those superpowers' mouths for the organization since they had a reputation, unlike his organization which just popped out of nowhere. There were other terms in favor of Felix and planet Earth. On the other hand, the terms he needed to fulfill weren't much. He just needed to sell them the first water potion and also provide 15 bottles 10 years later. That was a long period for Felix to pull it off. Currently, Felix was going on a shopping spree buying water, fire, wind, and lightning bottles from shops in those three superpowers kingdoms. Every shop was notified of the organization's discount and no shopkeeper disagreed with the discount since the kingdoms would be paying the total missing. Hence, Felix ended up buying from 43 bloodline shops more than 80 bottles. They were all epic tier 5 bloodline bottles. That cost him 30 billion SC but Felix didn't care about getting it back instantly since he would be able to earn it back easily after he sells 75% water bottle to the anti-royalty alliance. To deal with the filtered bottles, he was going to buy a bloodline shop in Empire and hire someone to sell them for him. Though, he wouldn't do it with his name or the organization. He didn't want the three superpowers to find out what's happening to those bottles. By using a shop, recovering his money would be a gradual process that may take months or years unlike when he was dealing with Luby. But Felix wasn't complaining at all since he had managed to purchase 21 bottles that had Avion species essence. With them, Felix believed that he would easily collect 35% to 50% of Thor's essence. He would have never gotten this much if it wasn't for allying together with those three superpowers. After all, if prices were normal, Felix would be required to pay an extra 18 to 20 billion plus the custom taxes that might reach up to another 10 billion SC. That's because he would be shipping outside of the galaxy. Meanwhile, for other bottles, Felix believed that he probably was going to gather enough to reach 80% in fire and wind bottles. This put him in a dilemma. Should he keep them to turn those Eric and Malak into primogenitor bloodliners or should he place them in his upcoming auction? Thankfully, he didn't inform Malik and Eric about them. Hence, the decision was taken after some consideration. He decided to place them for a sale so they would net him both 60 to 80 billion SC. As for Malik and Eric? They had yet to reach peak fifth stage of replacement and there was no rush to make them primogenitor bloodliners. Especially when they weren't even near him. Days went by and the news kept spreading by the three superpowers. People started to lessen their harassment of Felix after understanding somewhat the full situation. Now, instead of calling out on Felix, they were calling out for this phantom organization to release the method so everyone could work together on it. Felix left them to bark at the wrong tree and simply kept training his poison manipulation. He was edging nearer to finishing the J. Ramongandra's task. 
Two days later, at twenty hundred hours, Badadai had successfully delivered all of Felix's belongings when the spaceship had stopped next to the VIP wormhole expressway. During those three days' wait, Felix had filtered the first twenty-six bottles that he purchased. He had found from them, twenty-four percent fire, twenty-one percent wind, thirty-five percent water, and lastly ten percent lightning. He still had eighty more bottles that needed to be filtered. But Felix didn't do it now but left it after he reaches the Forsythia Witch Empire. Hence, he returned to his VR pod and entered the wormhole that led him almost instantly to the outskirts of the Forsythia galaxy after his permission to enter was approved. He already received it from Lady Sphinx's student. The Forsythia Galaxy Felix rubbed his chin while pondering, should I head to the nearest planet for a quick exploration? I still have plenty of TI. You better arrive in the next month if you want to catch up to the materials taught in the first semester. Lady Sphinx popped his bubble, the new year enrollments had just started and if you rushed now, you might not miss too much. Chapter 442, How to Become an Apprentice Podi Winner For real. Queen full speed to the capital. Felix always assumed that he was going to wait until a new semester starts before applying to enter the academy. A month or a two of wait were nothing much. But when the new enrollment had just started, he couldn't wait a full six months just to begin learning the basics of potion making. That's too long. Hence, he needed to reach the academy as fast as possible. Though he would still be delayed by an entire month since the capital was near the center of the galaxy and he was at the outskirts. He needed to enter two more wormholes to reach the capital. Elder can you give me the syllabus of the first semester? Felix requested, I will be behind by one month and I doubt the professors will bother to teach me privately from the beginning to catch up. I don't have it. Lady Sphinx said, I will inform my student to email it to you. All right, thank you elder. Felix sighed in relief at the sound of that. He understood that learning on his own wouldn't be as good as being taught in the academy but it didn't really matter since he would be learning only the materials in the first month. He doubted they would be too difficult. VRR VRRR Felix hastily glanced at his bracelet, thinking that it was Lady Sphinx's student but it turned out that it was from Malak. After reading it, Felix smiled faintly. Good, they have reached Peel Sky Island and met with Gramps. Felix sent a reply informing them to keep a close eye on his grandfather since the planet had already been infested with space sh.i.p.s and bloodliners. Most backgrounds had already arrived on the planet but they were all behaving well, allowing the citizens to return to their daily lives after the chaos had ended. After all, the Gamma organization was the one motivating the criminals to unleash their greed and cause chaos. But after their destruction, all of them returned to the sewers where they belong. Although the Council knew about the approach of other backgrounds, they still removed the lockdown, allowing the citizen to leave their homes. That's because of the alliance between Earth and the three superpowers turning official and public. Now, everyone knew that the three superpowers were seriously backing the planet, making them recognize the risks of harming citizens or creating chaos by bribing them as the Gamma organization did. This sudden change was easily guessed to be related to the Phantom Organization since the three superpowers had announced their alliance with it as well. After the announcement, the royal family made a peculiar move by announcing that they were planning on helping planet Earth thrive due to its potential, in other words, they took their side as well. Everyone knew that was bullshit, especially Felix and the Anti-Royalty Alliance. But the news did shake up the partnership between the Phantom Organization and the Anti-Royalty Alliance since it seemed like the Phantom Organization was playing both sides. However, Felix had ensured them that they had no plans to take their allies' enemy side. The moment they signed the contract, they were backing each other and Felix knew that wasn't a smart move to play both sides. Even if it was in the shadows. After all, the moment he gets caught, both of them would point their guns at him. Thus, he didn't contact the royal family at all after their political move that happened a week or so earlier. He knew that this was going to piss off the royal family but he didn't give a shit. 
he was already safe from their hands and they could never kidnap his grandfather or Olivia to threaten him. After all, they needed to hire natives to do their deeds. Which native was strong enough to deal with Malik and Eric? As for Olivia, she was living in the drop which was a fortress. Guys, make sure to keep your eyes open at all times. Felix warned, although you are staying on an isolated island, you never know who could sneak inside and pose trouble to my family. Heck, be careful of the family members as well as they could get bribed heavily to poison grandpa or something. Felix never trusted anyone in the family besides his grandfather, Noah, and Olivia. As for the rest, he didn't doubt that one of them might make a move on his grandfather for a billion SC or so. Be at ease boss. I am always following him. Eric promised loudly. Hearing it coming from you, I suddenly don't feel so. Felix chuckled and said his goodbyes to both of them. After dealing with his grandfather's safety, he looked at his inbox and found the email he wanted. It was an email filled with books and docs without a single word from the sender. Felix was quite curious about Lady Sphinx's student. He doubted that the Witch Queen was the one sending him this stuff. It must have been someone in a high position but not that high. Whatever, I will probably meet her soon. Felix removed those thoughts from his mind and focused on the email's content. After downloading it to his storage, he closed the inbox and clicked on the first book that was called Potion Maker's Ranks. The only thing Felix knew about the Poti Wana ranks their names and the potions they could concoct. Apprentice Poti Wana could concoct only rank 1 potions. Expert Poti Wana could concoct only rank 1 half potions. Master Poti Wana could concoct only rank 1 slash 2 slash 3 potions. Grandmaster Poti Wana could concoct only rank 1 slash 2 slash 3 slash 4 potions. Sage Poti Wunner could concoct all ranked potions from 1 to 5. However, he didn't know how they become one and what was the requirement to be promoted to a higher rank. Seeing that the book had 80 pages, made him realize that he was missing way too much knowledge. Without further ado, Felix opened up the book and read the first paragraph on the first page. It was an actual quote left behind by a witch called, Sage Marissa. I am fully ready. The moment Felix said so, he turned the page and began reading the book carefully. The first thing he read was, How to Become an Apprentice Poti Wunner. He spent five minutes until he finished the entire page and seeing what it was about. Summaring what he learned, Apprentice Rank was a license that was given by the Potion Makers Association that was responsible for giving off ranks, promoting, demoting, supervision, and many more. Which is needed to earn this license for them to concoct rank 1 potions legally and also pay taxes on them. Naturally, only potions sold were taxable. Plus, this license had multiple perks, like reputation, receiving discounts, having higher access to books, recipes, materials, etc. So, it was encouraged for witches to get their own license instead of concocting in the shadows. To get this apprentice license, a witch was required to pass a basic theoretical knowledge test and also concoct a rejuvenation potion successfully out of five attempts. Rejuvenation potions were one of the most common and needed potions in the universe. Hence, there would be never an excess supply in the market. The witches learning it would have a way to earn money quite easily the moment they turn into potion makers. However, since Felix was going to the academy, he wouldn't need to worry about going to the Potion Makers Association to earn his license. The Academy would be giving it at the end of the first semester to those who passed the final exam since it was more or like the same test of the association. Thus, in the first semester, Felix would be learning the basic theoretical knowledge plus other materials to pass the exam and get his license. Neat. Felix smiled and flipped the page to the second rank, Expert Poti Wunner. This time, he took at least half an hour to finish 20 pages about the rank. It was nothing like the apprentice rank. For a witch to get her license upgraded to expert Poti Wunner, she needed to pass the intermediate knowledge exam that was branched out into five subjects, potion making intermediate theories, genus potion studies, plants potion studies, 
Rank 2 Potions Catalog, Rank 2 Materials Catalog. To pass it, they required to score 80% plus of correct answers in each subject. After they passed it, they would move to the next test, which was related to the concoction. They would be needed to concoct a Rank 2 potion of her choosing in merely two attempts. Felix understood that Rank 2 potions difficulty was miles away from Rank 1 potions. No wonder being promoted to an expert Pody winner is the requirement for graduation. Felix wiped his sweaty forehead. I am kinda scared to see what I need to do to reach master rank. Felix's hand trembled as he tried to flip the page. The moment he did so and read the first page, Felix closed the book shut and picked another. That one page almost demotivated him from continuing on this path and he didn't dare to read the rest. One step at a time. Let's get our apprentice license first. The second book that Felix had picked was about the equipment needed and its uses. There were many pieces of equipment in the book, ones that Felix didn't even know existed. He only knew about the cauldrons, the circular table that looked like an oven, and some glassware. Even these ones, he didn't fully know their effect, how they work, and why they were needed for concoction. This book had truly broadened his horizons on those matters and he stopped reading it after reaching half of it in two hours. The planetary game will be played in the next half an hour. Felix glanced at his bracelet while waving away those holographic books. Felix went to the closet and picked his team's outfit. After wearing it, he unmuted the messages from George and sent him a short email. It entailed that he would meet up with them in George's UVR room in the last five minutes before teleportation to the game hall. Olivia would most definitely ignore me after meeting her. Felix chuckled after imagining Olivia's pouting expression. After all, he blocked her just like the rest for over a month now. Chapter 443, Reaching the Capital Planet One hour later Felix was back to his Androxa house after brutalizing the opposite team in the first five minutes of the game, bringing it to an early closure due to their surrender. It wasn't even a game but just one-sided bullying since the balls thrown at Felix and his team were easily countered by his absolute sand passive combined with the desert domain. After all, he was already exposed and there was no need to not go all out. Felix found it actually tough to deal with Olivia's frustration and his team's inquires more than the game. Thankfully, with the exposure of the Phantom organization, Felix simply kept telling them that he had signed a strict contract to not expose information. That led everyone to back off his back. With some sweet words, Olivia stopped being displeased at him for blocking her number all this time. Meanwhile, the ESG organization and the council were having the best day of their lives after realizing that Felix's exposure had brought all of his landlord's fans and other interested viewers to watch the game. This made its popularity explode so as the ticket prices. Not as much as Felix's individual game but it was more than they could ever hope for. Since the planet was earning 7% of the revenue, Felix winning the game had resulted in the planet earning a whopping 7 billion SC. Such a massive haul was truly imaginable to them and with it, so many things could be bought that could help the planet advance technologically. Meanwhile, Felix had earned almost the entire 3% of the revenue since he single-handedly destroyed the game in the fastest time possible. That netted him almost 3 billion SC while the rest received a couple of hundred of millions to split among themselves. No one was complaining since that was truly free money falling into their L.A.P.S without doing anything. The rest of the players regretted not fighting hard to secure a spot in this game. The moment Felix left the team after a quick celebration with them, they were all expressing their D.E.S.I.R.E to join the next game no matter what it was and how dangerous it was going to be. Too bad. Felix didn't want to spin the wheel for now since he believed that everyone was too weak for the next games and he didn't want to keep going one against an entire team every time. He understood that he was going to struggle when the team reaches the promotion game and enter the Universal Planetary Supremacy games against other teams from different races. Hence, he planned on postponing the next planetary game for two months until they all enter the peak first stage of replacement. No matter how the council disapproved of his take, they didn't dare to let out a sound against his arrangements. 
Felix was the big boss and they knew that it wasn't smart to step into his foot lest they end up ganged up by other leaders without Felix needing to say anything. Most of them were desperate to kiss his A.S.S and it was a fully understandable gesture with everything that was happening. Felix didn't care about any of this as the moment he teleported to his house, he took a quick shower and returned to reading the potion-making books like he just took a stroll for an hour and came back. He got to say that potion concoction was way harder than it seemed even though it was just a rank 1 potion. For external concoction that was related to materials preparation and such, he was getting the hang of it quite easily. But for an internal concoction that was related to the microscopic world? He was having a tough time due to his mental energy control that wasn't optimal yet. Meanwhile, he had already finished the J. Ramungandra's task and was currently learning how to turn poison into medicine. It was actually a simple process of choosing the right inducements and lessening their potency until their effects would be positive to the body instead of negative. Felix managed to pull it off in the first three days. However, since Felix had poison immunity, he couldn't benefit from this technique at all. Hence, he struggled to heal himself with poison since he was resistant to everything. The J. Ramungandra didn't inform him straight away with the method to create a passive like revitalization but gave him 15 days to think about the solution on his own. Three days had gone by since then, leaving only 12 days for Felix to solve this dilemma. Planet Femagrath Lady Sphinx is there going to be someone waiting to guide me after my spaceship docks? Felix asked while closing a book. Don't worry, everything had been taken care of by my student. Lady Sphinx smiled a bit wickedly, they will guide you straight to my place. Although Felix didn't see her wicked smile he still felt goosebumps coursing on his skin at her eager tone. Cough, shouldn't I enroll quickly in the academy since I am already late by a month? Felix stated. You have already been enrolled by the headmistress, who is also my student. Lady Sphinx informed. Headmistress. Felix raised an eyebrow and wondered to himself, was she the one who sent me those books? Hee <laughs> hee, it seems like my life in the academy won't be as bad as I am expecting. Although Lady Sphinx heard his thoughts, she simply chuckled softly and didn't bother bursting his bubble. Felix stopped bothering her after receiving the answer he wanted. For now, he simply continued reading his books while waiting for the Queen's announcement. Sir Felix the spaceship's speed had been reduced to subsonic due to entering a restricted area. The Queen informed. All right, how far are we? Felix asked. 3,000 kilometers. I see. Felix expected this since each advanced planet would have multiple space stations, mind meteors, space.i.p.s going to the planet or away, etc. This created some sort of traffic around the planet, making it impossible for space.i.p.s to continue flying at light speed until they reach the atmosphere. It seemed like Femagrath had restricted an area of 3,000 kilometers around it. Since they were traveling at this speed, Felix decided to log out from the UVR and take advantage of those couple hours to filter the remaining 80 bottles. Two hours later. Meanwhile, Felix was starting to feel a bit scarred from the needles with all the times he had to stab himself with them. Fortunately, the results of filtration were quite celebratory since Felix had collected enough to push all of the bottles to have 85% plus besides the lightning bottles, he only managed to filter 41% essence, making possess 51% total. This amount wasn't so bad, as it would get him 4 lightning-based passives and 2 active abilities. This speed wouldn't have been possible without the anti-royalty alliance. Felix believed that they must be crying after they received the bills from those shops he purchased from. As for the other three bottles, they were ready to be sold. If even one of them was sold at 40 billion SC, Felix would be earning 120 billion SC. He had no idea what he could buy with that amount but he wanted it nevertheless. He had already picked the two other backgrounds to sell the Fire and Wind Primogenitor 75% bottles. One of them was Galactical Army that was situated in the Guardian Empire and the other was the ancient Bardo family, the strongest member of the parliament in the Bardo Empire. 
he chose them since they were the strongest representatives in their empires and it was better to sell those two bottles to them so it wouldn't appear disrespectful. He had already disrespected the Mariana royal family by choosing to ally with the anti-royalty alliance and there was no need to pick a bone with the rest. Sir Felix, we have reached the docking queue. Queen informed. The moment Felix heard the announcement, he dashed to the window. The first thing he saw made his eye brighten up like a woman seeing up close a 24-carat diamond in her proposal ring. Femagrath, what a beautiful planet! Anyone who saw it would have to agree with Felix as the planet appeared somewhat like Earth with a mix of land and oceans, but there was a pretty huge difference. The atmosphere was pink. This meant that the oceans appeared pink in color just like the sky. As for the land? It somewhat resembled a jungle due to all the greenery it was showing. There wasn't a single barred place. Don't even mention a desert. However, the land didn't have much mass on the planet, probably not even 10%. Lady Sphinx isn't it better for you to be on a planet with sand? Felix wondered. No Lady Sphinx replied calmly while reading a book in her bedroom. Upon lifting her head and seeing his confusion, she removed her glasses and said, With my level of manipulation, I don't require a sandy environment. Why so? Because I am the sand primogenitor. Lady Sphinx waved her hand dismissively, Now buzz off, let me read in peace. Fair enough. Felix coughed and focused this time on the space sh.i.p.s that were standing still in front of his spaceship. There were some above him, some below him, and the line stretched to at least a couple kilometers. All of them were waiting to be checked thoroughly by the customs officials to see if they had the proper doc.u.ments, criminal records, and also if they were smuggling anything illegal. Just as Felix wanted to log in until his turn arrives, his bracelet vibrated. Upon seeing that it was Lady Sphinx's student, Felix raised his eyebrow in surprise but still accepted the call. Chapter 444 The Ninth Space Station Hello. He greeted. Hi, you can skip the queue and dock at the Ninth Space Station. A soothing elderly voice answered his call. Seeing how straightforward she was, Felix didn't want to waste her time with needless chatter either. Will someone be waiting for me at the space station or at the bottom of the space elevator? Felix inquired politely. My student would be waiting for you at the station's gate underneath. She informed calmly, the Queen AI will highlight her with a red aura for you to not miss her. Also, the guards all have been informed to facilitate your travel. Thank you for the help, madam. Um. Cluck. The call was disconnected and Felix didn't bother with it. He requested the Queen AI to skip the queue and head to that mentioned station. If he didn't have permission, he wouldn't have dared to attempt doing so since he would be subjected to a heavy penalty by the customs officials. But when his spaceship coasted away from the queue until it reached first in line, the Queen hadn't informed him about any upcoming messages or warnings from the customs officials. He simply waited a minute or two and he had gotten access to pass through between two humongous space stations that appeared like walls blocking off any other path but the one he was taking. Those space stations were one of the administrations of customs around the planet. Space sh.i.p.s weren't allowed to reach the planet without entering through one of them. Otherwise, they would be labeled as trespassers and get treated like ones. Planet Earth needed to reach this level of security if it wanted to keep non-natives away. Too bad, for now, they could only suck it and let everyone enter their planet like it was on a free market. After Dark Deviant passed through the checkpoint, Felix was met with the sight of thousands of space sh.i.p.s of all sizes and shapes, coasting around or standing still in an orderly manner like they were in a parking lot. The majority of them were berthed in multiple space stations around the planets that were connected with space elevators, leading to the different zones on the planet. Some stations were designed only for transportations like airports and such, while other stations were responsible for cargo and shipments. Felix didn't know the ninth space station's position but the Queen was taking him to it slowly. A short while, the spaceship docked successfully with the ninth station under the Queen's operation. Sir Felix, 
you are free to disembark. The queen announced, please head to the fifth gate. If you don't know where it is located in the spaceship, just follow the red arrow. Thank you. Felix quickly unfastened his seatbelt and went after the holographic red arrow. After a couple of turns, Felix finally reached gate 5 that was connected to the space station. The moment Felix stood in front of it, the gate automatically opened up, showing Felix a long empty tunnel that was able to support only one person at a time. At the end of it, there was another closed gate. Felix quickly walked towards it and placed his bracelet on the scanner at the side of the door. Welcome to the ninth space station Mr. Felix Maxwell. Following the robotic greeting, the gate opened up slowly to Felix. The moment you enter the station, your spaceship will disconnect and be sent to be parked away from the planet. The same robotic voice informed. Understood. Felix nodded his head. He always knew that his spaceship wasn't going to remain here forever since the docking spaces were needed to be empty always for newcomers. That's why thousands of space.i.p.s were coasting or standing in space away from the planet. They were parked for their owners and Felix's spaceship would join them soon. Since the Queen was the one operating them, there wouldn't be any traffic accidents at all. Mommy, I don't want to enter the space elevator. Move out of the way. Peep. Peep. Those people were mostly witches appearing like a paradise filled with beauties. However, there were other races in the station, like orcs, goblins, centaurs, giants, imps, dwarves, vampires, werewolves, halflings, slimes carrying suitcases, and more. It was like a circus of freaks and Felix being one of the few humans in the station was a new addition to this circus. Felix wasn't weirded out by the varieties of races in the station since he always knew that utility races like the witches and dwarfs needed other races to help them out with other fields. After all, most witches were potion makers, making them focus their entire time on it. This left occupations like bakers, farmers, hairdressers, lawyers, policemen, and the rest empty. This meant, they needed other people to fill those positions to keep the empire operating smoothly. Naturally, they would be only there to control the bots who were actually going to be doing most of those occupations. The robotic technology was too advanced to even take care of everything at once if the witches decided to use the ace. But for some reason, they prefer hiring other races for those jobs. They could live everywhere and learn anything. Plus, their wager wasn't that high. Hence, the witch empire had a lot of humans and Felix wasn't going to feel out of place at all when he visits the cities. Queen, please guide me to one of the space elevator's gates. Felix requested while inspecting the well-lighted station. Just like before, the queen created a holographic arrow and Felix followed after it. If it wasn't for the queen, people would have already lost their way in this gigantic station that span over 20 kilometers. Heck. It was like a city in space with lodging, entertainment centers, transportations, etc. Hi, handsome. Need a guide? A short green goblin with light makeup and wearing a grey dress, greeted Felix after he was guided to the transportation area by the Queen. Thank you but I am okay. Felix replied, smiling politely. The little female goblin immediately went to harass another traveler after getting rejected. Meanwhile, Felix paid for a hover platform and used it towards his destination. Some time later, Felix reached the space elevator's gates. There were ten of them placed in a cylinder-shaped silver tower that was long enough it reached the ceiling of the station. Each of those gates, had a long queue behind them, waiting for their turn to be sent to the station on the planet. Only one gate had a fewer number of people waiting behind it. Felix instantly knew that was the gate for VIP travelers and the one he needed to take. However, before he could reach the queue, he was stopped by two orcs who had brown skin and fangs protruding from their fat lips. They were wearing a blue uniform with a couple of letters at the back, making Felix realize that they were the security officers of the station. How can I help you sirs? Felix asked politely, not wanting to land in trouble so soon. However. The two orcs bowed respectfully to Felix and said, 
Please follow us, Sir Felix. Upon seeing that they were heading to the front of the VIP queue, Felix hastily chased after them after realizing that they were guards sent by Lady Sphinx's student to facilitate his travel. Naturally, such a blatant disregard to the queue had displeased the VIP travelers. After all, they had most likely paid millions to lessen the normal queue time that lasts for hours. That's because, there were only ten rooms in the space elevator, and each room could hold the utmost twenty people. Hence, each journey would take two hundred travelers down and lift two hundred more. In this traffic, that was barely cutting it. On what ground does he get to skip the queue? Didn't we pay all the same amount? A pale-skinned slender man who appeared like he never saw the sun in his life, grumbled while glaring at Felix and the orcs. He was standing in the middle of the queue, sandwiched by other dissatisfied travelers. A vampire. They sure are impatient for an undying race. Felix grinned at the vampire without bothering to slow down his footsteps or opening his mouth. Since the orcs didn't address their frustration, he had no intentions of doing so as well. Hence, when they reached the front of the line, Felix kept his mouth shut and bathed under everyone's resentment. Thankfully, the space elevator had arrived in merely two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow the passengers to exit the elevators first before entering them in an orderly fashion. If you don't know what to do, when entering the elevator, ask the Queen for guidance. Thank you and enjoy your stay in Femagrath. Following the cute feminist announcement, the ten gates had all opened up at once, displaying every twenty passengers sitting on white chairs while wearing their seat belts. When the gates were fully opened, the seat belts automatically unfastened, allowing the passengers to exit the space elevator. A witch even vomited on her way out, earning a couple of chuckles here and there. They understood that it was probably her first time riding a space elevator since most of them had that reaction when they rode it the first time. After all, the feeling of falling from outer space into the ground wasn't pleasant at all. Especially when the elevator's speed wasn't to be trifled with. Since Felix had rode plenty of space elevators in his previous life, he wasn't nervous at all. A few minutes later, the elevator was emptied and Felix shamelessly entered the VIP room first and took one of the seats that were near the window. The moment he sat down, the seat belt automatically affixed him to his chair. Meanwhile, the remaining 19 travelers chose their seats and got comfortable. No one bothered Felix but they did glance at him once in a while, wondering how could a human have such a high status to allow him to skip the entire queue. Even Felix was wondering what status did Lady Sphinx's student had to allow this. He understood that it wasn't the headmistress since her jurisdiction was based in the academy. This was the doing of a high authoritative witch in the planet government. Chapter 445, Meeting Lady Sphinx In a short while, the gates of the elevator had been closed. Everyone inside had been alerted of the experience they would go through and how to handle it properly. After this routine message had ended, Felix tightened his grip on his seatbelt and took a deep breath. The moment he finished, the space elevator began descending rapidly, giving him a sudden feeling of tightness in his C.H.E.S.T, like he was riding on a roller coaster. But Felix just controlled his breathing until he got slightly accustomed to it. Then, he glanced outside of the window and started admiring the pink sky and white clouds. In only a couple of seconds, the elevator had penetrated the clouds and emerged from the other side, exposing an enthralling sight of cities floating in the sky above gigantic pieces of land. All those cities were connected with long bridges, appearing like a honeycomb grid. Beneath those cities was a peaceful pink ocean. Vanderome, I am here at last. Felix smiled faintly as he gazed at those cities that appeared to be somewhat modern but keeping a traditional appearance of ancientness. There were no metallic skyscr.a.p.ers but there were castles and towers, resembling somewhat the buildings in the Victorian era of Earth. Felix knew that the witches preferred this architecture design as they have kept it for a long time without bothering to upgrade it to a more modern design. However, the transportation system and the technologies used in those cities were top-notch only below the metal race due to the booming economy of potions. 
Felix withdrew his head back after he noticed that the elevator was about to reach the ocean. It had already surpassed those floating cities since the space elevator base was built deep underwater. Only with such a base could the space elevator survive environmental hazards. Thud. After the elevator stopped, an announcement resounded inside of it, entailing that doors would open up in a couple of seconds and everyone should exit in an orderly manner. When it finished, the gates opened up slowly while their seat belts were removing themselves. Obviously, there was a long queue in the ground station for passengers willing to leave the planet. When Felix had distanced himself from the crowd, he started looking around, searching for his guide. The station's terminal was rowdy and crowded, making it a quite difficult process. Just as Felix wanted to send a message to Lady Sphinx's student, informing her of his arrival, he sensed that someone was right behind him. When he turned around, he was surprised to find a pretty witch wearing a black robe and a pointy hat staring at him indifferently. Standing 1.75m tall with tan skin, this witch had a very worldly feel about her. She had distrustful azure eyes that appeared like she was judging Felix by just staring at him. But her eyes did match perfectly with her flowing long azure hair that was reaching her waist. When Felix wanted to greet her, a long blue furry tail had emerged from behind her and started judging Felix as well from above. Just like Madame Hala's tail, there was also a giant flower-like azure eye that appeared exactly like the pretty witch's eyes. Lady Sphinx took a glance at the witch and said casually, That's Lara, one of my students' students. Before Felix could react to her claim, Lara gestured with her head for Felix to follow her and started walking through the busy pedestrians. Not wanting to lose her, Felix caught up and walked beside her towards an unknown destination. Since she didn't seem like the chatty type, Felix didn't bother starting a conversation either. Before long, they reached one of the station's parking lots. Felix was surprised by how smooth their journey went since he understood that he was supposed to be taken to the planet's custom administration. Then, he needed to be checked up close in person and also to sign either a tourist or a business contract. Both of them were limiting and strict to the signer to avoid causing problems in the capital, like escaping after his visa ended or harmed a witch in any way possible. Yet, Felix had stepped outside of the station without signing anything. Felix wasn't worried about the carriage not flying since he understood that the horses were more for looks while the true flight system was the same anti-gravitational system used in hover cars. Hence, he completely got comfortable in his seat even though he was still being stared at by three azure eyes. Instead of avoiding eye contact with her, Felix kept staring back with a faint smile, nodding his head lightly as greeting. This awkward silence lasted for a minute or two before the witch asked calmly, who are you? Lady, how can you pick me up without knowing anything about me? Felix looked at her speechlessly. I know that your name is Felix Maxwell and the trendy news about you in your galaxy. The witch leaned closer and asked again with her eyes narrowed, but who are you? What do you mean? Why is my teacher caring so much about you? The witch tilted her head in confusion and said, I doubt it got to do with the news about you. Hmm. It seems like she doesn't know the reason why I am here. Felix mused, might as well tease her a bit. Transfer student program. The witch arched her eyebrows and said, I didn't know we had that for our elementary school. Elementary school. Felix smiled while shaking his head. I am transferring to the Royal Academy. The moment his words resounded in the carriage, all of the witch's eyes widened in bewilderment at the start then to a miss.e.m.e.nt. A faint smile was finally cracked on her face, making Felix sigh in dejection at how pretty she appeared with an expression like that. How am I supposed to survive in the academy when every witch is prettier than the last one? This is going to be a tough three years to live. Good joke. The witch said, smiling mildly. I am not joking though. Felix asserted with an honest tone. Yes, you are. No, I am not. You can drop it now. Seeing that he wasn't going to budge from his joke, the witch didn't want to continue bickering with him since they were about to arrive at their destination. Hence, she dropped the subject with a simple mocking request, 
Let's meet at the academy then. Sure. Felix extended his wrist forward and said casually, Let's exchange our IDs. The witch glanced at his honest expression then at his extended wrist. She did so a couple of times until she laughed a little and touched his AP bracelet. I am Lara. The witch said with a charming smile, Your commitment to a joke is quite astonishing. Thank you. Felix shrugged his shoulders, not wanting to enter the same subject. He has already gotten her info and that was a win for him since he needed someone on the campus to introduce him to how things were run. Follow me, we are already quite late. Lara opened up the carriage door and went out first. Felix jumped down on the street that was completely paved with star-like blocks. While Lara was walking to a guarded gate of a towering grey castle that appeared like it came straight out of a fantasy book, Felix was checking the city that was left behind. It turned out, the castle was built at the highest point of the city, making Felix feel like he was standing on a mountain. Nine slim round towers were surrounding the castle. They reached twice the height of the walls and were connected by lower, narrow walls made of dark grey stone. Stylish windows were scattered thinly around the walls in seemingly perfect symmetry. Well-kept gardens with fragrant flowers, gorgeous trees and many bushes decorate the outside of the castle. This castle had clearly stood the test of time and its inhabitants were intended on making sure it stays that way for ages to come. This is a nice castle though. Felix praised sincerely. Based on some information Felix gathered about witches, he understood that castles like those were given to only sage potioners who could concoct rank 5 potions. Elder, are you in the castle? Felix asked while entering the gate after Lara. No, a clone of mine is here. Lady Sphinx said casually while still reading the same book. I see. Felix already expected that he would be meeting Lady Sphinx's clone since there was honestly no point for her to meet him with her real body. Her perfect copy ability reached a point when Felix wouldn't even realize that he was dealing with a clone. After walking through the castle's long corridor that had many artistic paintings hang on its walls, Lara and Felix finally reached a red gate that was left unguarded. Lara stepped forth and knocked twice on the gate before pushing it slowly. She stuck her tail's eye first and said from behind the door, I have brought him, teacher. Come in. Lara opened the gate widely after hearing her teacher's tranquil voice. The moment the gate was open, Felix raised an eyebrow in surprise after seeing two m.a.t.u.r.e gorgeous witches, drinking tea at a small table meant to host only four. Lara, you can go now. The gorgeous witch on the left side smiled faintly while gesturing with her hand for Felix to take a seat with them. Little thief, don't stand there. Upon looking at her golden eyes and the way she carried herself, Felix instantly realized that Lady Sphinx was the one talking to him. But she was a witch. At least she appeared 100% like one. I will get going. Lara bowed her head to the two witches and glanced at Felix one last time before closing the door behind her. Thief. Was he sent here to be punished for stealing something important to the teacher and her friend? Laram mused while walking away, meet me at the academy. As expected, he was full of crap. After Lara exited the castle, the conversation carried inside the room was entirely different than her expectations. Chapter 446, Entering the Lab Before I take you to the lab, let me introduce you to the Queen's advisor and also one of my students. Lady Sphinx extended her palm to the other gorgeous m.a.t.u.r.e witch and said, This is Dalaliya. If you require anything outside of the castle or ended up in trouble, just send her a message and she will fix it for you. Felix bowed his head respectfully and introduced himself, I am Felix Maxwell, I am honored to be under your care. The p.l.e.a.s.u.r.e is mine. Dilalaya smiled gently while nodding her head slightly in response to his greeting. When Felix lifted his head and focused on her face, he realized that she must be one of the oldest witches in the empire due to the few wrinkles next to her eyes. He understood that for witches to have wrinkles it only meant that their longevity was at its end and there was no other way to increase it artificially by potions or other materials. He didn't know her exact age 
but he believed that she would have been alive for at least 200,000 years now. That's because the average age of witches was 60,000 years without eating or drinking anything. For her to be this age while also having a queen's advisor position in the empire, Felix knew that she was an authoritative titan that wouldn't even bother glancing at Zazia or the Maganda chief. Elder, does she knows about you being a primogenitor or about our relationship? Felix asked telepathically, I don't want to say something that shouldn't have been said. Don't bother yourself with such matters. Lady Sphinx replied calmly, she knows what she needs to know. I know that you have many questions but save them to yourself. Lady Sphinx took one small sip of tea while standing up, follow me to the lab. We are running late. Felix stood up after her but Dalilia kept sitting in her place while gazing at Felix with her giant tail's green eye that had an X-shaped pupil. Felix felt goosebumps coursing on his back, making him believe that every inch of his body was being inspected by her eye. A split second later, the feeling went away as suddenly as it came. Felix didn't turn his head but just kept following after Lady Sphinx. After they disappeared outside of Dalilia's line of sight, she narrowed her eyes with a stern expression, he truly had gotten master's eyes. A human receiving such a gift is blasphemous on so many levels. She poured some black tea into her cup and wished, hopefully, he ends up dying in those experiments or master get bored of him quickly. Unfortunately for Elder Dalilia, she could only keep those harmful thoughts to herself since she knew that it wasn't possible to hurt Felix while Lady Sphinx was interested in him. Lady Sphinx wasn't to be provoked in the slightest. As her current oldest student, no one was more clear about this matter than her. Meanwhile, Lady Sphinx and Felix were walking down on a long well-lighted staircase that was leading to the underground. On their way here, Felix had met with plenty of servants and guards that appeared a bit dull and lifeless like robots. When he asked Lady Sphinx about it, she answered that every servant in the castle was made of sand and implanted with information that could help them do their duties effectively, just like what she did to the guardians. The only difference was that some of them had received information to be chefs while some received info that allowed them to garden like professionals. All of them were created realistically with an ability called sand creation, making Felix feel a bit dejected that he hadn't unlocked it. Not that it mattered now since Felix was soon going to replace Lady Sphinx's bloodline with Thor's, and he was going to lose all of his sand abilities. After all, he had already made his mind to etch the truth eyes. It was a no-brainer choice. Right now, they had already walked down for more than two minutes, yet there were no signs of reaching the bottom yet. Felix wasn't complaining since he had enough time to get some of his questions answered. No and no. Lady Sphinx answered bluntly without bothering to give him an explanation. Before Felix could switch to another question, Lady Sphinx raised her hand while stopping in the middle of the staircase. Felix stopped as well and peered with his infrared vision into the grey stone walls, wanting to see if there was some sort of a hidden door. Too bad, he found nothing. When he saw that Lady Sphinx had brought out a worn-out scroll with weird inscriptions on it, he focused back on her. Lady Sphinx brought the scroll in front of her face and started reading it softly. Two seconds later, she closed off the scroll and waited in silence. Felix did the same. Whoosh! A moment later, a light breeze passed by them from the front. Yet, this wasn't even the weirdest part but the materialization of a pitch black door that didn't have a handle. Lady Sphinx wasn't bored to entertain Felix's bafflement as she simply placed her hand on the center of the door and pushed it softly. The door made creaking noises as it kept opening up slowly on its own. The moment it was wide open, bright light escaped from the other side of it, making Felix narrow his eyes a bit. But soon, they bulged out of their sockets at an unbelievable scene that no one would even dare of imagining it. Even Asna and the J. Ramungandra were left in a bit of a shock by it. Who could blame them? The door was leading to an enormous golden pyramid that was built on a floating land in the middle of nowhere. There was no sky, no stars, no moon, just pure darkness surrendering the shining pyramid. Yab! Lady Sphinx said casually, this is one of the ones I took control of. 
They are perfect for my lab since they are separated from, well, everything. This is the first time I hear or see something like this. Felix asked with a worried tone, is there oxygen inside? It looks even bleaker than space. Naturally, I have made the environment to be livable for all races. Lady Sphinx gave a side glance meant for idiots and said, how am I supposed to carry my experiments on them if they can't breathe? That sounds promising. Felix said with a hollow laugh. Let's go. Not wanting to continue chatting, Lady Sphinx led the way at a normal pace. Meanwhile, Felix placed a foot inside, feeling the ground first. He appeared like someone feeling the coldness of the pool's water. Hurry up! Lady Sphinx rushed him from afar. Upon hearing so, Felix took a deep breath and jumped through the door. The instant he did so, the door was closed shut and disappeared after, making Felix swallow a mouthful. Queen, can you tell me my coordinates? Felix requested while walking with an alarmed expression towards the pyramid. Alas, no one answered him. When he called for the fourth time, Lady Sphinx informed him, don't bother calling her. Your connection had been disconnected with her the instant you entered this dimension. Truly, Felix noticed that his bracelet's signal that had always five lines had turned to an X mark that he never saw before in all the years that he possessed an AP bracelet. Felix had gone on many adventures in his previous life, exploring parts of the universe with his clan mates. Yet, the signal had never been dropped by one line. Wait, doesn't this mean that I can't stay here for more than two hours? Felix remarked loudly while sprinting towards Lady Sphinx. When he reached her side, he continued on, being disconnected with the queen is the same as taking off my bracelet. If I don't connect in two hours, the queen would assume that I trying to escape from my contract's strings. Especially the ones concerning her being as an executioner. Felix knew that he should avoid this at all cost if he didn't want the Alliance's task force, who were specialized in this matter, to hunt him down. They weren't made from humans but from multiple races that were born to locate and eliminate their targets as fast as possible. Relax. Lady Sphinx waved her hand in a carefree manner and mentioned, I only need one hour with you to run some tests and create a perfect copy of your body. Then, you are free to go and enjoy your stay in the academy. I see, wait what? Felix was startled by her plan as he always expected that he would be spending days tied to a cold metallic bed while Lady Sphinx experiment on his numbed body. Don't be weird. Lady Sphinx rolled her eyes at him after reading his thoughts and said, I just need a perfect copy of you to run the first simulations. When I create a plausible method to make it possible to host multiple elemental manipulations, I will use it on your real body. Thank God. Felix couldn't even express how delighted he was at the sound of that. Through the entire journey, his imagination was running wild at being tortured and that the pain would be intolerable. But it seemed like he was thinking too much. Oh, you will be feeling pain all right. Lady Sphinx smiled warmly while opening the pyramid's golden gate, it's just not going to kill you. After saying so, Lady Sphinx entered the pyramid, leaving the stunned Felix behind. But soon he broke out of it after he heard the echoing footsteps of Lady Sphinx as she walked deeper and deeper inside a long dark corridor. Wait for me. Worried that the pyramid might be booby-trapped like some sort of ancient structure, Felix steeled his guts and dashed after her. When he reached her side, she had already entered a bright wide room that appeared somewhat like a mad scientist lab. At the sides, there were cylinder-shaped glass tanks filled with thick blue matter or dark ones. Inside them, there were multiple weird-looking creatures that seemed to be still alive. There were also three clean silver metallic tables that were taken by a vampire, a panda-like creature, and a human. All of them were strapped and had dark bruises on their bodies, sending shivers down Felix's spine. However, his fear had withdrawn with a snap of a finger by Lady Sphinx as they had all turned into a pile of sand. Be quick and lay down on one table. Lady Sphinx snapped her finger and her entire appearance had been turned into her original humanoid furry cat version but without wings. She was wearing a white robe and glasses, making Felix feel like he was in the hands of a doctor. 
He honestly didn't know why she was wearing glasses when her vision was probably the best in the entire universe. But seeing how impatient she was, Felix didn't bother her with this but asked, Cough, should I take off my clothes? Chapter 447, Drinking the Lightening Potion Yes. Lady Sphinx replied bluntly while her eyes were changing. There was another red triangle pupil above the golden triangle pupil, marking the use of the second class. E.M.E.NT quantum vision. Without an ounce of shame, Felix got nude in two seconds, leaving only his U.N.D.E.R.W.E.A.R on. Then, he laid on the cold surface of the table in a straight line. Lady Sphinx approached Felix and did nothing but stare at him up close. She started from the head and ended up finishing when she reached his feet. All right all done. Lady Sphinx removed her glasses and informed, I have copied everything about you to the last atom. Felix got quite curious when he heard so. Before he could ask, Lady Sphinx extended her palm towards the other table and another version of Felix had been created. The similarity between them was impeccable. Elder, does my copy have the same pain tolerance as I do? Felix asked while sitting at the table. Felix doubted that would be possible since pain tolerance and such were more about mentality. I don't care about pain tolerance. Lady Sphinx clarified, the first simulations and experiments are always deadly. Even if you had ten times your pain tolerance, you will still die from shock. Felix neither wanted to imagine that nor argue with her about its validity. But he still had to ask a question that was always bothering him, Elder, don't you think experiments in the UVR are hundred times more efficient? Even if you experimented on me there, I wouldn't die and you will be getting clearer results. Felix knew that most labs were erected in the UVR due to tens of benefits that reality could never provide. Mentioning a few, infinite materials, controllable environments, no germs, controllable senses, etc. If a drawback needed to be mentioned, it would be the need for the researchers to own the material in real life and scan it. Only then, would the queen be able to recreate a perfect copy of it and let them experiment on it. But in Felix's eyes that wasn't really a problem for Lady Sphinx. So, he was quite baffled by her antics. He honestly started believing that she might be old-fashioned and all of this is just a matter of preference. Upon hearing his thoughts, Lady Sphinx shook her head, You know nothing kid. What do you mean elder? Confused, Felix arched his eyebrows while looking at her. Damn it, I am even more curious now. Felix wore his pants with an annoyed expression, does she not trust the UVR privacy or something? Before Felix could dive deeper into other guesses, his eyes were stiffened on six potions that had been beamed next to him. Each one appeared more unique and dazzling than the other. Felix got excited instantly as he knew that those were the promised potions. This is the lightning potion. Lady Sphinx held a spherical glass bottle that was filled with a murky whitish content that was turning black from time to time. You can drink this now since the effects are almost instantaneous without any issues. Lady Sphinx threw the bottle in his L.A.P, making Felix catch it nervously, almost dropping it in the process. This potion cost at least 45 billion SC. That's only if it was in the market in bulks. I am going to drink a 45 billion SC potion. Felix opened the lid gently and brought his nose near the bottle's hole, wanting to smell its aroma. Alas, the smell was so disgusting, he threw up a bit in his mouth. He quickly closed the damned lid forcefully and kept it away from his face. Seeing his reaction, Lady Sphinx knitted her eyebrows and said, You better not throw up when you drink it. I won't concoct another. It wasn't up to him to control his gag reflexes after being assaulted. I can do this. Felix opened the lid away from his face and planned, I just need to drink it in one swift gulp. After taking a deep breath, Felix closed his eyes tightly and truly gulped down that murky matter in one go. The moment his gag reflexes activated, Felix closed his mouth shut with his hands while his eyes were bulging out of their socket, almost tearing up a bit. Don't you dare vomit in my lab. Lady Sphinx warned him sternly. 
Felix's eyes got a bit teary and red but he still swallowed everything in his mouth, making Asna disconnect the connection between them as the sight was too disgusting even for her. Cough, cough. In the end, Felix broke into a coughing spree but thankfully everything had already been consumed. Just like Lady Sphinx mentioned, he didn't feel anything at all afterward. If it wasn't for the lingering disgusting taste, he would have doubted that he drunk a potion. Thank you Elder. Felix showed his appreciation by bowing his head respectfully. Lady Sphinx waved her hand dismissively and informed, those other five potions require a thoughtful sequence of drinking. Lady Sphinx picked a square-shaped bottle and said, This is the Neuron in them scent potion. It will help you enhance your neurons, making the transmission of information to other nerve cells, muscle, or gland cells much faster than the average brain. Felix was quite shocked at the sound of that since he knew that this potion wasn't just going to make him smarter and quicker on his feet but literally quicker on his feet. That's because it would affect his reflexes and reaction speed making his battle senses even better. How much is this potion? Felix asked with eyes gleaming brightly. You are too poor to know. Lady Sphinx shut down his excitement right there and continued on with the next potion, this is the infamous photographic memory potion. You already know what it does. I want you to drink it a day after you drink the Neuron in them scent potion. Felix carefully noted the sequence since it seemed like it wouldn't end pretty for him if he ignored it. Hence, when Lady Sphinx mentioned the remaining bottles, the entire sequence had been memorized. She gave him a warning glance, don't lose it if you don't want to lose your limbs. Felix nodded his head while beaming everything in his spatial card besides the scroll. He opened it up and tilted his head in confusion after seeing the weird-looking inscriptions. So. How do I use this? Felix asked. Don't worry, I will read it for you when you try to reach the spatial gates spot. Lady Sphinx said. Knowing what she meant, Felix nodded his head and beamed in the scroll as well. Then, he asked politely, what room should I take in the castle? You can spend a day or two here until you finish drinking all potions and entering the second stage of replacement. Lady Sphinx mentioned but after so, Dalalaya will take you to the academy where you will be living. Felix raised an eyebrow and asked, Don't you want me to stay near you if something happens in your experiments? Don't be stupid. Lady Sphinx said, It will take me months until I succeeded in creating a plausible path to make your body host another elemental manipulation. That is the end goal not making your body tougher. That could be done any time I wanted with hundreds of methods. I see. She wasn't going to stop until she makes it happen. Now let me work in peace. Lady Sphinx shooed him away while walking towards his n.a.k.e.d perfect copy. Upon seeing that she had undressed his copies u.n.d.e.r.w.e.a.r while having a surgeon-like knife in her hand, Felix immediately bolted outside of the room with his hands tightly holding his crotch. He had no idea what she was going to do to his copy's little Felix and he had no intentions of remaining to find out. Hang in there F1. Take one for the team. Terrified, Felix rooted for his copy loudly while running outside of the pyramid, heading towards the door's spot. Upon hearing so, Lady Sphinx chuckled lightly while starting to work on the copy by cutting a piece of skin from the waist. Then, she placed it on a piece of glass and started peering into it closely, inspecting the genes. My genes are dominating his genes extensively due to this bloodline system. Lady Sphinx murmured, humans are truly too dependent on borrowed strength. But this system is perfect for the little thief due to his lucky chances. Hence, it must remain no matter what. Let's see what cultivation system is going to merge well with his body. Lady Sphinx showed a pure smile and snapped her finger, creating two more copies from different races. One body belonged to a vampire and another to a werewolf. Let's start with those two. Chapter 448, Thor's Mutations Ten minutes later, Felix had been taken to a room at the top of one of the castle's towers by a servant. It wasn't the best room in the world but it got everything that he needed. The moment he got comfortable, he undressed and sat on the cold wooden floor. 
He beamed Thor's bottle that was filled with 51% of his collected essence and placed it next to him. He then beamed the rest of the integration materials and started practicing his breathing exercises to remove all of his tension and nervousness. He had already decided to integrate first then drink those brain-enhancing potions since he was worried that they affect his integration negatively. After all, he would probably need some period to adapt to his brain enhancements and that would make him delay his integration for a week or two for safety reasons. Hence, it was much better to get it over with first. How much are you going for? Asna asked lazily. 11% this time. Felix replied while drawing exactly that amount in his needle. Previously, when he replaced the J, Ramungandra's bloodline with Lady Sphinx, he had used 10% since that was his limit. That 10% had given him three mutations, hair, eyes, tail. Now, he wanted to increase it by 1% since he believed that he could make it and also have a better chance at getting other useful mutations. Just like the first time all of his sphinx's mutations would be replaced, including his tail. Looking at it, swinging left and right playfully, Felix C.A.R.E.S. said it gently and said, I will miss you. Can't I even have a moment with my tail? Felix grumbled while bringing the needle near his heart. After taking another deep breath, Felix took out a leather belt and placed it between his teeth. Then, he injected everything at once and followed it by drinking other potions for integration. Asna, Jay, Ramungandra, and even Lady Sphinx, all focused on Felix, who was waiting patiently for the pain to kick off. A minute later, Felix's heart thumped loudly once before an unimaginable agony kicked in all at once, assaulting Felix's entire being. M. Yet, only muffed out noises escaped through his tightened lips making Asna throw a bunch of popcorn in front while booing him. Felix didn't think of anything but the hellish pain that was making him want to dig his own skin and destroy his entire nervous system. Yet, no matter how tough it got or how much bloodshot his eyes appeared, Felix had prevailed through the entire duration, lasting full 15 minutes without requiring Asna's assistance to not faint. Unlike the first times, Felix's entire body was fully bloodied, making it impossible to see what were the mutations that he received. The only noticeable thing was the disappearance of his tail. Felix had laid on this bloody pool for over two hours until Lady Sphinx decided to be kind and send a couple of servants to take care of him. They picked him up and made him drink a couple of advanced rejuvenation potions forcefully until his body wasn't flimsy and all wounded. Then, they took him to the bathroom and cleaned him up thoroughly. Afterward they left him lying in a hot tub with his head outside of the water. A couple of minutes later, Felix's eyelids started quivering slightly. The sleeping beauty is finally up. Asna giggled while sitting together with Lady Sphinx and the J, Ramungandra. They both laughed at the sound of that. Sleeping beauty. Felix murmured while rubbing his eyelids, How long was I asleep? How did I get in a hot tub? Upon hearing so, Felix thanked Lady Sphinx for the help since he understood that all of the servants were more like bots controlled by her. Then, he stood up from the hot tub, feeling more refreshed than ever. However, when he tried to stretch his arms, he ended up facing a large mirror that was placed in front of the tub. The moment he saw his new appearance, he understood Asna's joke. It turned out, his hair had been transformed into two halves. The right half appeared as white as cream while the left half was as dark as the night. It was long, silky smooth, and wet. If he made them into a piggy-style haircut, he would truly resemble a princess. As for his face, well, it remained somewhat the same since his eyes didn't mutate this time. However, he did notice that the pupil had been changed to white instead of golden. But Felix ignored everything else as the moment he focused closely on his pale skin, he noticed that there were tiny holes in it. This freaked him out a bit since they appeared as his pores had just expanded. Agitated, Felix jumped outside of the hot tub and dragged his long hair to the mirror with him. When he saw his reflection up close and touched those holes, his heartbeats started rising in agitation, what the hell is this mutation? 
Felix could comprehend the hair color scheme somehow since the J. Ramungandra had shown him how Thor appeared in his humanoid form before, but he never expected to get this mutation at all. The worst part, it wasn't just his face but his entire body was filled with those tiny holes. No need to freak out. The J. Ramungandra comforted him with a chuckle, you lucked out on the evolutionary trait of the Avion species, no, I believe you got it even better since you obtained this trait from Thor himself and not just a random Avion. Upon hearing so, Felix's heart skipped a beat since he understood that the J. Ramungandra wouldn't praise an evolutionary trait unless it was truly worthy of his attention. This got him curious and also elated to find out what it does. He didn't need to ask as the J. Ramungandra informed him, I don't know if Sphinx's castle is using electricity or other forms of energy but try to find an outlet in your room and touch it. Felix lifted his head and looked at the light crystals in the ceiling. Those crystals could be powered by the sunlight for merely a single day but last for at least a month. Whatever, I can test it out in the measurement center. Felix's elation was dropped down a notch but he wasn't freaked out anymore by the mutation. Though, he obviously didn't like having those tiny holes appearing, since he knew that anyone who could zoom in on his skin would be able to see them. Since they are a mutation, I can physically hide them by closing them off or something if adapted into using them. He reasoned. He was quite confident in his conclusion since when he saw Thor, he didn't have those holes. Now that he somewhat dealt with this unknown mutation, Felix's attention was brought back to his long white and black hair. Due to it being wet, he didn't know exactly if it was wavy, curly, fluffy, or straight. He didn't want to find out while it was three meters long. Hence, he quickly beamed scissors and gave himself a quick haircut. When he dried it up, he was pleased to find out that it didn't look bad at all with a short-styled haircut. After admiring it for a few seconds, Felix switched his focus to his eyes that hadn't been mutated besides the pupil's color that matched well with his hair. He smiled pleasantly at the news even though it seemed like he received only two mutations this time and one of them was useless. This will save me the pain of getting back the mutation during the etching process. Felix knew that the moment he etched the truth eyes in his 1% human bloodline, the newer mutated eyes would have been replaced yet again with Sphinx's eyes. That would cause another round of pain but the eyes would remain permanently this time. That's one of the reasons why no one bothers to etch an ability before a replacement stage. It was possible to gain the etching enhancements before truly replaying one's bloodline but it was a foolish move that no one recommends. After all, what if someone etched an ability related to the eyes before replacement, causing the eye to keep its mutation forever when his next eye mutation was ten times better? Since it was permanent, all hope to get a better eye mutation was gone. In the case of Felix, the truth eyes were most certainly one of the best eyes in the entire universe. That's why Felix didn't hesitate to sound his request to Lady Sphinx, Elder, can you help me edge it please? You better own up to having them. Lady Sphinx warned him with a finger before snapping it. It's done. She informed. Much appreciated Elder. Delighted, Felix touched his eyes that pricked him for a split second before returning to normal. Although he had seen it before with Jay, Ramungandra's etching process, he was still astonished by how instantaneous it was. If it wasn't for the feeling of the added strength, enhanced energy capacity, and all of those etching enhancements, he wouldn't even believe that it happened. Let's test everything at once. Felix said while walking outside of his room's bathroom. When he reached his king's iced bed, he laid on it while wearing only his shorts. He closed his eyes shut and logged in. Although he didn't unlock any lightning-based ability yet, Felix was still eager to see how strong he was after his body received another round of enhancement. Since it was from the primogenitor, he wasn't certain yet if it was going to be the same as before or increased due to his body being much stronger than the last time. Chapter 449, Testing the Avion's Evolutionary Trait Half an hour later, Felix had finished testing the etching enhancements. It turned out that his guess was correct as the enhancements weren't the same as last time. First, 
he was now capable of throwing a punch that was carrying 7,100 bf. That's an increase of a whopping 3,000 bf, unlike the last time when he received only a 2,000 bf increase. As for mental defenses, he was able to survive against a peak fourth stage mental ability now. Though the fifth stage was still too much for him. Lastly, for his energies and their capacities, they had been doubled yet again, allowing Felix more leeway to go wilder in his energy consumption. All of those terrific enhancements made Felix believe that maybe after each stage, the enhancements would keep doubling since his body would keep getting stronger and stronger to handle it. He hoped that it was going to be like that since even with those enhancements, he still wasn't certain about his chances at winning the Universal Individual Supremacy Games. Let's test out this mutation now. Felix said eagerly while touching the holes in his palm. He had already done a five minutes research about the avions and this evolutionary trait. Based on the network's info, those holes were called lightning absorbers. They were the ones that allowed the avion species to live in thunderstorms without wings and consume clouds. He was standing in the middle of the room that had already been modified for physical tests. But when he glanced at the ceiling, he found that dark clouds were starting to emerge. They weren't peaceful at all as the lightning flashes and thunder cracking noises had engulfed the entire room. Are you ready? The AI asked. Yeah, wait. Felix's excitement died down a little after remembering that he didn't have lightning resistance. He understood that without it, he might get killed straight away by the strike. He wasn't certain that those lightning absorbers were going to protect him against lightning since it wasn't mentioned in the network. AI, give me lightning immunity. Felix requested. He didn't want to take any chances with a lightning strike. He preferred testing out the lightning absorber's resistance on an outlet with low voltage. You ready? The AI asked again. Felix took a deep breath and gave a slight head nod. Felix wasn't given even a millisecond to finish his nod before a flash of light had blinded his eyes while the cracking noise of thunder had resounded in his eardrum. Before he could realize what happened, everything had returned to normal like he wasn't just stuck by a thick lightning bolt that could kill an elephant instantly. SZZZLZLZLZ. But the white charges that were being emitted from his body said otherwise. Anyone who saw him would exclaim in shock as Felix had stopped appearing like a human but more of a lighting torch. His messy white and black hair didn't escape stiffening like spikes in his head just like the rest of his body hair. PFFFF. You look like a spooked cartoon character. Asna laughed her A.S.S off the moment she checked on Felix. At least you didn't have a thick beard and long hair like that idiot Thor. The J, Ramon Gunder chuckled. Every time he engulfs himself in lightning, he turns into a spiky porcupine. Lady Sphinx sniggered softly after being reminded of such a scene. SZLZLZL. Noticing that the lightning intensity wasn't as sharp as when he got struck, Felix stopped bothering with his looks and brought his palms closely near each other. That resulted in creating a storm of lightning charges connecting his palms together. Because he had lightning immunity, Felix only felt ticklish in his palms. What now? Felix wondered, how am I supposed to control or channel them? Heck, can I even control them? Felix doubted the validity of that since the avions were known for simply absorbing the lightning bolts to keep them always flying with a terrifying speed. However, it said nothing about them channeling it to attack or defend themselves. You are right. The J, Ramungandra interjected. Avions can't control their evolutionary trait but Thor was able to. He turned it into a lethal weapon that made him one of the most annoying primogenitors to fight against. At least before he managed to reach the peak of the third stage of elemental manipulation. How so? Felix asked with an intrigued look. If even Rocky can't catch him, how could we? The J, Ramungandra said with a hopeless tone. He was truly a pain in the A.S.S to fight against. It seemed like the J, Ramungandra had struggled in his previous battles against Thor, unlike the last one that ended up with them both dying. This just further emphasized how difficult it was to kill a primogenitor and if J, Ramungandra and Thor didn't decide on suiciding in an epic manner, 
the battle would have ended up differently. Hee <laughs> hee, I can't wait to be a pain in the A.S.S to others as well. Felix grinned widely. Although it seemed difficult to morph into a lightning bolt, he wasn't planning on focusing on that for now. He still needed baby steps to learn how to channel, absorb, and also contain. That's the most important step since if he couldn't contain the absorbed lightning, it would keep being released continuously until it was exhausted. Just like what he was experiencing now as the charges had been reduced in number while his hair started to lose its stiffness. From J. Ramungandra's story, Felix realized that Thor was capable of containing it, unlike the Aviones. SZZSZLZ. A few seconds later, Felix's body had returned to normal after all the absorbed lightning had been spent on nothing. Instead of trying again, Felix sat on the ground and started pondering on the method to contain lightning. He understood that as long as he doesn't learn it, his evolutionary traits potential would be gutted hard. Well, if I considered myself as a bottle, this meant those holes allow lightning to come in and out. Felix pondered, this meant, the most obvious way to contain lighting is by closing off those holes immediately after absorbing. This was quite problematic to Felix since when he entered the measurement room, the first thing he did was order those holes to close off. Alas, he received absolutely no response like he was ordering for his pores to close off. That was naturally impossible for the human conscious to control. But since Thor was able to do it, he knew that it was possible. Elder. Don't know. Fair enough. Felix coughed and returned to brainstorming after his attempt to request J. Ramungandra's help had failed. Maybe it's related to time. If I kept using them over and over again, I might be able to close them. Felix shrugged his shoulders and stood up, there is only one way to find out. AI, strike me again. Crack. A couple of hours later. Felix had ended his mutation experiments in high spirits. Although he didn't manage to close them off, he learned a lot about his mutation. First, lightning energy couldn't be absorbed by the trait. Only lightning and electricity were absorbable. Second, there was a threshold to how much lightning Felix could absorb at once. If he ever went above it, his body would implode from within. The sight wasn't pretty when it happened. To avoid that happening in real life, Felix requested the queen to measure the limit and warn him if he ever approached it. She simply measured the voltage of Felix's body right before he exploded again. It was a worthy sacrifice since now he knew that his limit was 7,4 million volts. Compared to commoners' bodies that couldn't withstand even 100 V+, this made Felix more like a god of lightning. But honestly, it was only due to his fake lightning immunity in play. Without it, he would have been fried instantly from a single bolt. Felix understood that he might be immune to the lightning effect but the energy it carries was still enough to kill him if he crossed that limit. But he wasn't too worried about it since he had taken at least 20 natural thunderbolts before he reached it. Those two findings took merely 20 minutes of his time. The last experiment was the reason why he stayed hours in the measurement center. It was related to his speed that was increased so much. Felix felt like he was always a turtle before. Subsonic speed, 340 meters per second. That's how fast he was moving due to the absorbed lightning bolts. To test it out extensively, Felix modified the room as a circular track and sprinted over and over again until he runs out of steam. Unfortunately, he usually runs out of it in merely a minute. That might not sound bad but Felix understood that he wouldn't be able to rely on real thunderclouds every time in his fights. Instead, he would mostly absorb his released lighting from his abilities. This meant, he would probably have 20 seconds to 30 seconds of fuel if he decided to be generous. Nevertheless, Felix was beyond satisfied with his mutation and he understood that speed wasn't its only application. He still needs to spend hours and hours until he brings out its true potential. But that's for later, Felix had played enough and it was time to drink those intelligence-enhancing potions. Chapter 450, Increasing His Intelligence Based on Lady Sphinx's sequence, Felix would need five days to drink all of them without affecting his brain negatively. 
Without further ado, Felix beamed the Neuron Enhancement Potion and drunk it in one gulp, having no intentions to savor its taste since its smell wasn't that good either. He didn't know if Lady Sphinx never bothered with the taste or those potions were meant to be disgusting like this, unlike the elemental potion. Seconds went by and nothing had happened yet to Felix. His head felt normal and his senses were the same as ever. Elder, does the potion need few minutes for its effect to work out or was it supposed to be like this? Felix asked. Felix could understand that he wouldn't feel a thing when drinking the lightning potion but for this one that was supposedly going to enhance his neuron's speed? He knew that it was impossible to happen without feeling something. Lady Sphinx stopped reading her book to glance at his condition. Instead of answering him, she smiled charmingly and counted backward, five, four, three, two. With each number, Felix's nervousness increased tenfolds as sweat started to form on his forehead, worrying that another wave of pain would strike him at the count of zero. Yet, when Lady Sphinx reached it, nothing happened to Felix, making him doubt if Lady Sphinx was pulling a joke on him. However, just as he wanted to sigh in relief, he felt like the world was spinning for a split second before everything turned dark. His forehead smashed into the wooden floor so as his body, he fainted instantly. That's what Asna and the J, Ramungandra had assumed until they realized that his heart wasn't beating anymore. Speechless and frankly a bit worried, Asna and the J, Ramungandra turned their heads to Lady Sphinx who was chilling on a couch with a book in her hand. Seeing them gazing at her like this, she waved her hand in a carefree manner and said, It's nothing major, just a brain stroke. Relax. Lady Sphinx said calmly after noticing that their worry had intensified, he will wake up as nothing happened in the next couple of seconds. Did I pass out? He asked softly while beaming a rejuvenation potion. Honest as always, Asna informed him with a look of relief, nothing much. You just had a brain stroke and a heart attack at the same time, resulting in you being dead for eight seconds. I guess I passed out. Felix murmured while drinking the rejuvenation potion. He completely ignored Asna's claims. Prick, I am telling the truth. Asna cursed him after realizing that her credibly meant nothing to Felix. Of course you are. Felix massaged his temples while standing up. When the pain went away, he realized that, well, there was no noticeable difference. It made sense since he wasn't overloading his brain currently with difficult thoughts. I guess an IQ test will do the trick. Instead of bothering Lady Sphinx again, Felix simply requested the Queen to project an IQ test with hard difficulty that was meant for everyone. It's a test of intelligence, something we are largely born with. It wasn't a test of knowledge which represents what we learn through our education or life experience. The test rules appeared first in the hologram, making Felix read quickly since he hadn't done this test for years now. Slash slash you are about to solve 40 visual exercises slash questions that gradually increase in difficulty. The test duration is 5 minutes. The Queen will supervise any cheating attempt. Press start when you feel ready slash slash. In Felix's previous life, he took it when he was 30 years old and scored 20 points which translate into him answering 20 questions mistakenly or he didn't have time to even reach them. That score resulted in him being marked with 112 IQ which was barely close to being above average. Those questions slash visual exercises all challenge not just a person's knowledge but cleverness and speed at spotting the issue required and solve it. Most of the time, even a child could solve those issues. However, the essence of the test was the ability to spot the requirements to solve the questions. The faster he did it, the more questions he would be able to solve, which would help him finish the test before the timer ends. That's why, the moment the test began, Felix noticed a huge improvement in the way he was approaching those questions, as he never took more than half a second to realize what he needed to do and the correct choice he needed to pick. Half a second. In some questions, he barely glances at them before he solves them and presses next. He couldn't explain the feeling but he started to believe that there wasn't a single problem that he couldn't solve. Upon hearing his idiotic thoughts, Lady Sphinx merely rolled her eyes and returned to reading her book. 
Meanwhile, Felix didn't lose focus for even a split a second, making him finish a five minutes test in under 20 seconds. The Queen informed Felix of the results immediately after the test was concluded, resulting in a snalafing and mockery at his results. Imagine drinking an intelligence potion yet still fail to answer five questions. She said with a ridiculing tone. Unbothered, Felix checked the false questions and realized that all of them were based on knowledge. It was understandable since there were questions mixed in about races, cultivation systems, the SG platform, etc. It was impossible for Felix to know everything just like others. Those few questions were added to make it almost impossible to score full marks and be labeled as a freak prodigy. If one actually answered them, then he truly deserves the title. Hence, it didn't affect Felix's happiness at all at getting such a massive enhancement to his intelligence. Tomorrow when I drink the photographic memory, I will be able to close down this knowledge hole by reading everything that my hands land on. Felix said with an eager tone. You better start with rereading those potion-making books. Lady Sphinx advised, the potion would help you remember anything that you did after consuming it. However, your memory would still remain shitty for your old memories. Will do. Felix agreed at once. He understood that those gifts might be too good and everyone would kill for them, but he needed to work his A.S.S off in the academy to fulfill his end of the bargain. That was emerging as one of the top three scorers in every semester. God knows how hard it was going to be to achieve it. Though, he felt a bit confident with those enhancements. Don't be. Lady Sphinx popped his bubble, sage witches are able to concoct those potions as well. They might not be good enough to concoct potions that give permanent effect, but those potions were still good enough for their students to excel above the rest in the academy. Damn it, doesn't that mean my advantages are gone? Felix gulped a mouthful after hearing so. He realized that it was far worse than he said since those witches had years and years of time to read about potion-making books before even entering the academy. He didn't know how many students were lucky enough to drink those potions and he honestly hoped that none of them would be in the first semester. I don't know about the rest but Dalalaya's youngest student Lara has drunk three potions and she has just enrolled in the academy last month. Alas! Lady Sphinx seemed like she was in a good mood as he kept destroying his wishes the moment she heard them. This can't do. Felix stood up hastily and asked, Elder, I want to go to the academy now. Each second he wasn't in class, Lara and the rest of the potion abusers were pulling ahead of him. He had no intentions of finding out what would happen to him if he failed to fulfill his promise. You have Dalalaya's UVR ID. Lady Sphinx shared. Just message her and she will take of it. Upon hearing so, Felix immediately sent a short polite message. Surprisingly, he received a reply instantaneously, entailing that she would send someone to pick him up in half an hour. Half an hour. Felix closed his eyes shut and thought, might as well see if I can utilize second class. E.M.E.NT, the quantum vision now. Ten minutes later, Felix exited the UVR with a dark expression under a snazz jeering laughs. The tests didn't go as expected as his mental energy had been fully consumed under two minutes during his use of the quantum vision. The sad part, he couldn't go beyond the microscopic world as Lady Sphinx had demonstrated to him. All of this was caused by his trash mental energy capacity that couldn't fuel this vision. Whenever he attempted to force himself, he either ends up fainting or has his head explode. How am I supposed to concoct potions with only two minutes to work with per day? Felix knitted his eyebrows, I can train all I want in the UVR without worry but in real life, I would be the joke of the year if those witches ever caught wind of this. Felix already considered himself to be an outsider in the academy. But now? He wouldn't even be taken seriously.